Let's see. Forgot to do this. Wait, I gotta do this. Um, yeah, we're gonna read this book right here. Abominable Snowman. Legend come to life. by Ivan T. Sanderson. Astonishing, abominable snowman legend come to life. And the back says, abominable snowman, strange, weird, half man, half beast, who have roamed the face of the five continents since the beginning of time. Are they myth, or are they an astonishing, unbelievable fact? Ivan T. Sanderson, famed explorer and naturalist, draws the truth about these amazing phenomena from out of the shadows of legend. The result is a definitively, definitively researched, utterly fascinating report on the astonishing other man who have haunted the mankind from prehistory pre to tomorrow. What are they? The hairy giants of Vancouver Island, the Mothman who Carvings only uh, red craves, craves only red meat, the thing that rips tongues out of cattle, the weird men of Russia, the stinkers of Malaya. Um, there are only a sampling of the published cases of subhuman trolls and what used to be called ape men, documented and discussed in this definitive book by eminent field biologists. The abominable snowman ape appearing for the first time in an updated revised edition is a master of work on this subject that has challenged the skeptics and kept thousands of readers utterly spellbound. This is, uh, uh, there it goes, abominable snowman legend that comes to life and I count of reports on the existence of the ultra prim primitive hominid of five continents. Now, not to see if it's ultra primitive. This is published, but uh, copyright is 1961. As discovered, you have to go to older stuff to even find the truth. We seem to have a problem these days with consolidating information. I, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but it costs money too. Uh, forward uh, to the reprinted edition. This is here, number, chapter one, or part one. I'll go chapters, and shouldn't say chapters, but uh, the creation of unpleasantness, a history of ABS. Misers, abominable snowmen, misers, uh, mares. What am I trying? It's not misers. It's Mary. The abominable snowmen, Mary, uh, on a ubiquitous woodman report from Canada uh, from 1860 to 1920. Uh, further Sasquatchery. Let me just read that. The appearance of Bigfoot, the footprints on the sands of, uh, in our own backyard, late North Americans, uh, on the track of Africa and the darkness, in the east and the mysterious, the great mix-up, anyone for Everest, 
uh, Western approach, Eastern horizon, appendix, importance of feet, bibliography, uh, focus for understanding the index. Okay. Forward to the reprint edition. History is currently taking a most peculiar and remarkable turn. In the dimmest and furthest past, man presumably knew practically nothing, but then throughout thousands of millennia, he gradually acquired wisdom and an ever-increasing understanding of his environment. This culminated in the dawn of what we call the scientific age. Then something very curious happened. On one hand, our knowledge of the world we live in starts to advance with ever-increasing momentum. But on the other hand, even more matters that had interested our ancestors were tossed into a sort of intellectual trash can on the grounds that they were preposterous. I'm speaking, of course, of what we now call the Western world. The people indigenous to other continents other than Europe and North America, that is, do not toss out the, these things. Now we of the West have reached an impasse. Starting in about 1920s, as suspected, there can, came a great, spontaneous, unheralded, and unapparently, and apparently unprovoked change in public, if not scientific, opinion. People as a whole began to question everything, religion, science, our social organization, and even our history, and at least as taught things that had been uh, either forgotten or suppressed forever uh, a century, if not two, suddenly began to crop up all over the place. At first, however, these were mostly of a fractal and pragmatic nature. Uh, the revolution of ideas did not come until 40 years later the year in which this book was written. <clears throat> One of the results of these two changeovers is the turn in history which I mentioned in the outset. Year by year since about AD 1920, more and more allegedly new discoveries are being traced ever further back in historical time. In fact, history of just about everything has suddenly speaking historically started to be pushed ever further back in time generally take simple items like the first metalworking and the first village settlement and the first written record uh, the first art and the first boast even the first man 40 years ago, anthropologists gave the impression of being convinced that modern man first saw light around 50,000 years ago. Now, the data in our years is heading to 2 million mark. We're just making up stuff, too. But, you know, as far as the actual dates. Except that it's much older than we want to. For most, a lot of people want to admit, for, or maybe not, maybe, maybe people don't even care if at the end of World War II, Westerners seem to have come to the blissful conclusion that even if we did not have all the details filled in, we knew the overall picture of everything. The Scopes uh, Monkeyville trial was proclaimed a triumph of scientific logic or traditional beliefs. The biblical statement on creation was said to be purely allegorical, scientific truth to be proven. Everybody sort of relapsed into a new intellectual utopia. Both religion and science had been challenged, uh, both, but both had proved their points. By a sens sensible compromise made possible by the equally sensible employment of logic, both were perfectly correct. It was merely a matter of semantics. It is nowhere 
stated in the Bible that God created the world precisely on a Friday in the year 4400 BC. As Bishop Usher has said, science never said that it was created precisely 4.00 billion years BC. Both were merely figures of speech. Unfortunately, both were f f figments of the imagination. Unpleasant thing continued to turn up and with increasing regularity and insistence. These were items that did not fit into either the old traditional patterns of beliefs or into the new scientific logic. Most of them had been around literally since ever, but they had just died away increasingly since the inception and acceptance of scientific methodology. There were dubbed old wives' tales, and then despite their persistence among laymen, were progressively denigrated until even the last schooled country bumpkin came to laugh at them. The job was almost completed by 1920, but then something happened. People started dredging up these old wives' tales and writings about them. They were colorful, they were historic, and they were just clean fun, but as such popular trash began to blossom, people started saying things like, hey, that's not so damn stupid as you think, my grandmother, and so on. And encouraged by this, more and still more people began dredging in the family attics, the historical societies, the old books, and the classics, even into the Bible. And with a decade, there were those who were showing the audacity to state that some of these things were not old wise tales. <clears throat> But factual accounts by their own new wives, and, do, and don't you try to argue with her, bud. Thus, certain aspects of history began to reverse themselves, and the classic example is that of which we are right, and which we are have dubbed uh, A B S M Mirror Mirror. Uh, Murray, a, a B S M Murray's, for short. Uh, this began for the Western, uh, in the for the Western world, in 1920 to 21, with the coining of the catchy mocker, moniker, the catchy moniker, abominable snowman. This was greeted with boots of derision, hoots of derision, but the utmost glee by British press. Nevertheless, it was, it just would not go away, and throughout the 20s and 30s, the business built up and up with ever more evidence from, in, this, in the case of the Himalayans, mountaineers, military, and other government personnel, and even traveling scientists. Reports kept pouring out of these, uh, this area and all to the effect that initially, initial silly suggestion that there was or is a creature in Central Asia, the name of which was mistranslated as the abominable snowman was actually not silly at all and so insistent were these reports that the stay-at-home scientists were forced to try to refute the matter. In this, they not only failed miserably, but they opened new floodgates of diversion and speculation among the press and the public because their arguments and their attempts refu uh, refutation, attempted refutation were manifestly so uh, puerile, puerile. Uh, I, I think that's what it is. The net result was renowned, renewed 
outbursts of reports coming from every more respectable, liable official persons. This whole business was up until World War II an almost exclusively British affair, but immediately thereafter it became fully international Swiss, Japanese, Argentinians, Austrians, Russians, Mongolians, Americans, New Zealands, and even Indians, and the local Nepalese Nepal, Nepal, and Tibetans. I guess the Nepalese and Tibetans got into the act and still ever more precise and categorical reports of these creatures really exist and are not just old Himalayan wives tales resulted, but the stay home and the other experts who had never been within 5,000 miles of the Himalayas continued to rant and scoff. Not such, no such thing could be, they stated, and because it was impossible, however, just who said so, they did not offer the state. They did not offer to state. Then the whole business broke out like a rash in both North America and Russia. True scientists began to pick up their ear, prick up their ears and proper expeditions were organized. Newspapers and millionaires and governments poured money into the effort and truly concrete evidence began to come in. First it was mere reports, then plaster casts of footprints, then hairs, then piles of excrement, then photos of beds, and finally some still photos and film. The embattled experts had now to contend not only with the general public, the, uh, the travelers, the officialdom in the press, and the literature scholars of half the world, they had also to bad, battle a firmly entrenched Italian in their own midst. These were an international group of absolute top-notch scientists and notable physical anthropologists holding a much higher position than theirs and with far greater credits than their titles. The next and as of the time of writing, final stage was then initiated. This was is a bibliogra bibliographical and historical research into the matter, and this not only within the limited confines of the Western literature and record, but worldwide, and with notable emphasis on Asia. Literally, within months, the results was a sort of landslide reveal, rever, uh, reversal of history. Everything, you'll see everywhere one turned, uh, ever more records of these a, a, ABSMs cropped up, and ev everywhere from Indonesia to Sweden, from China to Ireland, they even turned up all over North Central and South America. And as the years have passed, this flood has not only burst the bin dam, but brought to light something else. This is that the whole business was never an old wives' tale in the first place, but a perfectly straightforward historical record of fact in our ancestry and of that of our prehistory and culture and political writing his, written history, it is now it is only now after having reached what we uh, thought was the end of the road that we have really started to uncover just what is what and what really happened in the past. The book is an historical record of that history and the history of the historical reversal. Ivan T. Sanders, Columbia, New Jersey. Abominable Snowman. And then it's got this map, map one, a distribution of ABS, ABSMs by continent. 
and it's hard to see but you can see there's a little dark areas in North America we should be all over now and it's everything's changed it's <laughs> but it's old uh, a map one distribution of, uh, of um, ABSMs by continents the surface of the earth is somewhat clearly divided between areas of two kinds one which we call land but which includes certain peripheral areas at present under sh shallow seas forms uh, rafts of certain kinds of rock uh, of lighter density is some 40 miles thick the other which constitutes the ocean floors uh, is covered by a much thinner layer of these strata the hydrosphere or water capsule of the earth finds its own level due to gravity um, you just call it gravity or you can <laughs> um, as a result the first areas are sub uh, sub aerial the latter is sub aquatic uh, the former are land masses the latter oceans with adjacent seas the first are not however the continents which are specific land areas uh, with associated uh, promontories promontories and islands each of which has a unique history and structure flora, flora fauna these are seven in number with the islands of the South Pacific forming an additional unit current reports of and myths of legends and folklore pertaining to ABSMs are now recorded from five of the continents map two most important feature of the land surface earth to animals and thus to man is the type of vegetation that clothes it there are seven major types the equator the equatorial 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 i can't say the damn word the equatorial the equatorial the equatorial closed canopy forest so the equatorial closed canopy forest the open orchards the tropical savannas the scrublands and hot deserts the steppes the prairies and park lands of the temperate zones the closed canopy deciduous and conifer coniferous forests of the high latitude and the tundra and the barren lands of the polar circles these girdle the earth in order from Ecuador to equator to poles and successive belts by all of them waver but all of them waver to north and south and expand and contract continuously in a variety of ways these variations are due solely to the influence of major ocean currents at altitude uh, has no effect on these beltings but on mountains the succession is repeated uh, vertically irrespective of, of, of latitude a, a B S M's appear to occur only in mountainous regions and almost exclusively in in those which lie in the forest belt the one exception is eastern Eurasia and that's not necessarily true because we're filming them here in the east so let's change today the entire land surface of the earth is the uh, three human race 
then I'm not gonna the map's too blurry so I'm just gonna read this stuff the surface of the earth apart from Antarctica the Greenland ice cap and a number of islands mostly and the polar regions is officially inhabited by modern man actually he lives on considerably less than a tenth of the total land surface modern man is divided into two very distinct groups the primitives and the non primitives and the former consists of the australoids uh, 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 from australia and apart the melanesians the melanesia uh, the bushmen of southwest africa uh, the little uh, negroloids pygmies in central africa and the nig uh, negritoid pygmies of the Adan men Adaman Islands, excuse me. <coughs> the Malay Peninsula and the Philippines. There are three divisions of non primitives and the Mongoloid, the Caucasoid and the Negroid. Of the first there are five subdivisions of two and three and five and two but with other, another group the hematic derived from intermixture with one of the caucasoid groups currently the west caucasoids and the sudanese negroids have greatly extended their range notably to the americas note on the map due to scale and then it's uh, I mean I don't know if I want to blow it up it's, it's that good it's that good of a map anyways let's see so it's talking about temporal uh, lowlands uh, uplands uplands uh, mountainous I can't read it anyways this is not that important you can find plenty of references to such things. <clears throat> Map for North American vegetation. This con continent should be regarded as reaching from the Arctic ice raft to the isthmus, isthmus of Tehon, Teh Tehuna Tepec. Tehon Tepec, I guess. Tahona to pick. It is divided into three parts first into the western and eastern, and by a great barrier, the dividing line running roughly down the 110th meridian. Secondly, the eastern half is subdivided latitud latitudinally, uh, latitudinally about the 45th parallel to the north being closed forest and tundra to the south open forest parklands and prairies the midwest south, southwest and mexico are arid and covered with shrub and desert the rest of the mountainous and forests almost exclusively with conifers and the mexican sierras there are some tropical forests along with the eastern fringe of the continent lies the Appalachians, and there is another upland area uh, in Labrador. The valleys of Mississippi and its tributaries form extensive swampy bottomlands. And there's no point in really looking at the maps because I mean, maybe I got another copy of it somewhere. It's, it's a little better. Um, <clears throat> Map 5. That might be easier to read. This is a, an arbit arbitrarily chosen area designed to bring out a number of different physical features. It represents an area of some 1,900,000 square miles of which some 1,650,000 are land. This is cut di diagonally by the Great Barrier here represented by the Rockies that extends from the, Ant the Arctic coast to Veracruz on the Gulf Coast. 
to the east of this are lowlands covered in the northern by a great boreal conifer-conifer-conifer-conifer-conifer-conifer-conifer-conifer-conifer-conifer-conifer-conifer-conifer-conifer-conifer-conifer-conifer-conifer-conifer-conifer-conifer-conifer-conifer-conifer-conifer-
you know, you can only live on credit and grants or loans for so long before you had the, the collector start showing up. And by that time, you start paying this stuff off and then something happens like what happened to me. You know, I had a halfway decent job on the railroad, work for Norfolk Southern, and I ended up getting MS. <laughs> so by the time I finally had some kind of hope, um, it all fell apart before my eyes again. So sometimes I wonder if I'm just supposed to be doing something like this. Just maybe it's a very part of my development where I'm supposed to just stay still. I don't know what else to do. I think a lot of people in my circumstance. So what do we do? So what I'm going to do is read books for a while, write my book for a while, learn how to play the guitar for a while, and do it in chunks because I'm not very good at multitasking throughout the day, and um, learn some shit. And while I'm at it, I'll share it with you if you're interested. And if you're not interested, I don't blame you because I'm not very good as a reader. So, our communicator. This represents an area of some 200,000 square miles. Uh, this is British Columbia. 90% of this is uninhabited, despite the enormous conglomeration of the city of Vancouver, the old capital of Victoria on Vancouver Island, and the somewhat extensive cultivated areas on that island and about the lower reaches of the Fraser River from Agassiz. West, I think, sorry for putting it pronounced right, Agassiz West, the coastal plains of Putin Sound uh, at only 2%. The whole of it, apart from Vancouver Island, the Fraser Delta, and the Putin Sound area, is mighty mountains and great parts are not truly explored. Though there are now excellent large scale maps. Uh, resultant from aerial surveys, the Olympic Mountains and the coastal fringe northwards are Vancouver Island and the north of the lower Fraser River are clothed in an immensely tall, severely layered rainforest, sever several layered rainforest with conifers pre predominantly the largest trees in the world are found here and choked with mosses, ferns, and broadleaf undergrowth. And the other areas are heavily forested, but for, but for their peaks. So heavily forested for the peaks and mountains. Northern California, as you just saw, um, I wonder why they had the maps flipped over. It's, it's kind of... Oh, okay. And the area of, of the, this map represents approximately 45,000 square miles, all but a small portion uh, at an extreme south area of San Francisco and the silver of the upper Sacramento Valley are mountains. And these are not extensively excessively high but are very steep and closely packed with deep narrow gorges between however the various blocks that contained within the, this area are not all homogeneous the mighty cascades are volcanic and much larger than the coastal ranges the Klamaths are the oldest from the f form a faunistic point of view, from a faunistic point of view, the trinities are never are newer and somewhat different phytogeographic constitutions. Along the coast, just south of the Cape Blanco, but a little way from the coast, to a little south of San Francisco Bay is the land of the great redwoods, Sequoia, uh, Semperverians, if that's right, pronounced right, Semperverians, 
kind of hard to read so the whole mountainous part is clothed in almost unbroken forest the ABSMs or abominable snowmen have been report been reported at, from Clear Lake in the south to the northern edge of Saskatchewan and beyond the northeast and of course it's changed quite a bit since people start opening their eyes and what do you say when you live in northwest Ohio like me and you see them in the middle of the town now I haven't seen one uh, with my eyes since 2017 but I filmed them still I filmed one last time I went seriously uh, squatching I filmed one I even got uh, it looks to me like the movement of eyes but and it looks like a stump it's very black and dark and it's, and it's um, it looks like it's on force in a ball <laughs> that's what it looks like I mean I could be I have to look at it again I did a video of it but most people don't know about it and don't, maybe I should re repost it remind people that I filmed a freaking Sasquatch back in May of this year and since then I kind of just like you know I know they're there I've seen them I filmed them I've filmed the things in the trees I filmed some stuff in the sky this fall um, it's getting cold now so there's no point in me even I don't there's no point in me suffering um, out in the cold <laughs> I got enough problems as it is you younger bucks and your health for your guys you do it I'm cheering you on uh, just uh, be uh, unless your intent is as evil or negative then I'm not cheering you on okay uh, Guatemala the position of the Republic of Guatemala an overall area of the map shown by square and box which in turn encompasses what is properly called the Central uh, America Guatemala is divided into two very distinct parts the northern called the Patin I guess it's P E T P E T E N which is a lowland heavily forested plateau and the southern which is mountainous and where uh, there are large numbers of volcanoes both active and idle to the west these mountains are contagious contingu contiguous continuous maybe that's what it means to say continuous with the eastern rim of the Chiapas in Mexico the southern coastal plain is arid and the northeast corner of the country which reaches the big the big the bite I think it reaches okay I gotta try to read this again the plain is arid in the northeast corner of the country which reaches bite of Honduras uh, is that the right word it says bite of Honduras in the Caribbean and there is a limited sea level triangle containing the so-called Lake of Is Isabel actually the Laguna de Isabel and this is really an arm of the sea and is connected to it by a river like channel the, the area from which a marvel snowman have been reported centers around the peak named San Chi and the Sierra de Chocos if I said any of that right I have no idea but I guess what he's trying to get at is this area right here I think unless we do we use it this one oh there's maybe it's the Guatemala that's what he's talking about right here the Honduras you, you won't be able to understand so it's unfortunately not very good maps but they're good enough to get his point across but they're not you know This continent is most, in now South America, the most notable of it lacks the associated islands, 
It is today composed of three subcontinents, continents joined by extensive lowlands. The former are first the Andes chains of mountains, and they contain Alto, Alto, Alto Planos, the ancient uh, Guyanan Mastiff, and the eastern uplands, the last is divided into two parts. The mountains around the Mato Grosso swamp, swamps and the vast area of Cartingas. That can't be right. Is that right? It says Cartingas. Uh, between these three major upland blocks, there are three enormous drainage basins. Those of Orinoco, and Amazon, and La Plata. All of these are multiple river systems with innumerable tributaries uh, that meander through extensive forest lowlands surrounding the upland mastiff, mastiffs and bordering these air river basins are intermediate plateaus. These are mostly clothed with savannas and the southern tip of the continent, south of uh, the La Plata, these intermediate lowlands are covered with tall grasses, pampas, and further south uh, with scrub. In the extreme northwest, there is a block of equ equ equatorial <coughs> forests of on the Pacific side of the Andes. Caught off abruptly to the south by an ex excessively arid western coastal fringe, ABSMs have been reported from the Colombian area, from the Guyana Mastiff, Massif, is that how you pronounce it? No, I call it Mastiff, and it's not that. It's Massif. M A S S I F. Massif. Why do I keep talking Mastiff? That's because I can't read which shit. From the mountains around the Mato Grosso and from a few points in the central Andean highlands, big feet have long been rumored from the uh, Patagonian region, but the matter is they're um, muddied with the ground sloth business. Now they got a map of Africa. I guess the point across is that they're all over the damn place. Map of uh, uh, Africa, Mac, map X, 10. Africa is the second largest, most compact of the continents, uh, apart from Madagascar, which is hardly a part of it, and Fernando Po in the west. It also is singularly lacking in peripheral islands, and the northern rim is really a part of the continent of Eurasia and lying as it does today north of the Great Sahara Desert. Has not only a different climate, but to a large extent flora and fauna differing from that of the rest of the continent. Africa is divided into three parts, the Northern Desert Belt, the Central Forest Belt, and the Southern Desert Belt. However, further confusion is produced by there being extensive and almost overall highlands that highlands all the way down the eastern half of the continent and other extensive upland blocks in the Northern Deserts and the western half of the forested equatorial belt. Africa also has three large basins, but all are inland and without any real outlets. Two, El Jaf, El Jaf, and the Bodel now lie in the deserts. The, th the third is that of the Congo, the second biggest rivering, rivering system in the world. Uh, the tall, closed canopy 
equ equatorial forests are actually rather limited in extent and are clearly divided into four parts in the west and center. The lowland coastal forests of the east are not TEF, I guess they're, yeah, whatever that stands for, um, and are more arid. Uh, ABSMs are reported from three forest areas with a rumor from the far southwest. And that is the Africa that he's talking about. So we got the Kalahari. The Hagar, Eurasia, Ethiopia, Guinea, Guinea, Massif. Um, anyways, this is not. We did Africa, right? Yes, we did. So then I guess he's gonna do China and India now. The Northern Oriental uh, Political and then or Orientala. And of course this is Asia as we call it. India and China and uh, Russia. Eleven is Northern Oriental political. The Oriental uh, is today formed a political point of view, a appalling hodgepodge. This continent lies to the south of the southeastern end of Eurasia, all of which is Chinese. Uh, most countries have, for centuries, recognized Tibet as being part of the Hajmi the, to the west, it is bordered by Iran and Afghanistan and a thin eastern extension of the latter separates, separates it from the Ur Russia or USSR, which no longer is the USSR, it's Russia. The, the greater part of it is covered by India and two pieces of Pakistan. The eastern half is about equally divided between southern China proper and eight other sovereign states, Burma, Thailand, Laos, uh, Viet, Minh, Viet Minh, Vietnam, Cambodia, M Malaya, and Indonesia. In addition, there are sundry territories such as Sar Sarawak, Sarawak, Wak, Wak, uh, uh, of other status, and some small colonial possessions. Right in the middle are the independent kingdoms in Nepal, which I don't think is anymore in the territory. Uh, as far as is it still independent? I don't know. In the area. Sikkim and the intermediate anatomy of Bhutan. The islands of uh, Ceylon is an independent country and there is also a sundry tiny enclave, enclave such as the Portuguese colony of Goa. Map, 11, or map 12 is Oriental law. Geographically, Tibet is part of the Oriental, but due to its extreme latitude, it is connected to the with Eurasia. Orientalia is divided into six parts: India, the Himalayas, Indochina, Southern China, uh, Malau, Malayao, Indonesia, and the Philippines. For the last three divisions. See map 10. 
in this continent we have three major levels lowlands mountains and super mountains most of the first are clothed with equatorial forests but there is a large desert area in western pakistan and most of southern china lies in the temperate forest belt and has distinctly mediterranean flavor the mountains fall into seven major and my, many minor blocks and there are two complexes in india and Arak, arakan arakan i guess that's what's called and i don't know if the settings I, just, I don't know how many of these things have changed in the past well this was written published in 1961 so uh, 40 uh 62 years huh it's still relevant even today though in my opinion the indonesian massive the anums and the southern chinese massive and the uh, uh, Fokian complex the Fokian complex lesser blocks are on the peninsulas and islands the himalayas constitute a special region the ranges of the names are immensely long but narrow and are erect erected upon a huge upland and then there's something in chinese paidum whatever the hell that is and let's find out what this word means Because he keeps using it in massif. What is a massif? Then we're going to find if we can pronounce it right. Massif. It's a massif. And it's a compact group of mountains, especially one that is separated from other groups. Massif. And there you go. Massif. East and uh, South Orientala. The eastern half of the Orientala is also enormously complex from the topographical and phytogeographical point of view. It's Central core is a huge Indo-Chinese peninsula, a vast mass of mountain ranges running from north to south, and that lies between the Indian and the Chinese lowlands. This about southward onto the vast lowlands which constitute Thailand. From this depends on the Malay Peninsula. Around it, it lies a diadem of islands. Uh, Let's find out what that diadem means. I always, you know, I've read it before, and I think I know what it means, but I'm not sure. A jeweled crown, that's what I thought it means, or headband worn. Uh, diadem. Diadem, I, I think I've is it in the Bible. Uh, and jeweled crown or head ba band worn as a symbol of sovereignty. So it must be a figurative speech here, um, kind of like a bunch of jewels or dotted islands, so like on a crown. So a diadem of islands, this is starting with the and. Damons and the Nicobars in the Bay of Bengal on the west, encompassing, encompassing the greater Indonesian lands or islands of Sumatra, Java, and Borneo on the south, and continuing on via Pala, 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 Palawan uh, to Philippines and Formosa, Taiwan. 
to, uh, on the east. Between and among these are literally hundreds and thousands of other smaller islands, plus another string of long the coast, terminating in Haiyan. Haiyan, I guess it be. Haiyan. Is that what it is? The southern eastern end of the continent is Walsh's line running between the Philippines, Borneo, and Java on one hand, and the Celebes uh, and the Australoid Islands on the other. Blah, 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 blah. I guess we're getting a... Malaya and Sumatra. This is small area is one of the most peculiar in the world. It is there are it there are living a large number of animals not found anywhere else while the other relatives of these are found far away. Most odd and still least known of all are the Barisan Mountains of the southern Sumatra uh, in and around the which ABSMs particularly in the form of the pygmy Sedapa <coughs> have been for centuries allegedly alleged to exist. These and other unknown primates are reported from the East Sumatran lowland forests and the swamp belts and from the inner mountain block of Malaya Peninsula. The Vet to Y Islands have a unique apes and monkeys. Then we are at now map 15 Eastern Eurasia. This most complex geographical setup in the world forms a vast triangle some 3,000 miles along its western face which is the great barrier abiding unto the Russian steppes and some 2,500 miles along its southern curve which runs from the Parmars the Pamars along the southern rim of the Tibetan Plateau to Saikang if that is Saikang? Saikang I think that's what it is, but there's something next to the G, but it's like, I don't know if that's supposed to, what it's supposed to be. Um, and 3,000 miles from there along the eastern face to meet the barrier in eastern Siberia. The whole of this is basically a high plateau, the central portion being a hot desert. Upon this and all around its rim lies immense mountain ranges. In the south, there is the upper, the super uplands, the plateau of Tibet, with even greater ranges upon it. And it is an, an astonishing fact that the greatest of all mountain ranges in the world that forms the southern rim of the Tibetan Meltet Plateau and contains the Everest block has no recognized name in English. This, this of course, 60 years ago, so it probably changed. I haven't bothered to look because I didn't know I was going to read this, so I just started to just read this. So. Uh, and contains Everest block and it's not been in English. The Tibetans and the Nepalese know this as the mother of all mountains. And the Ma Dasara Ra Des Hung P. I don't know, uh, um, P. Behom, if I said any of that right, the Karakorams are the western edge of the range, Everest block. Whew. A certain unpleasantness, a brief history of the A, 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 A B S M Murray's Murray, the ABS and Murray. I don't like how that sounds. I like uh, what Keel, he just 
chopped off the URI part and just go to the ABSMs. I think it's, much easy, it's actually easier to just say abominable snowman, so. <laughs> so maybe just call it that. In the 1887, a major in the medical corps of the British Indian Army, Lawrence Austin Waddle, LLD, CB, C I E, F L S, F A I, I E, Doctor of Laws, Commander of the Bath, the Commander of the Indian Empire, Fellow of Linnean Society, Fellow of the Athro Anthropological Institute, was meandering about in the Eastern Himalayas doing what that rather remarkable breed of men were wont to do, that is, a bit of shooting, some subdued exploring, and a certain amount of pollicking, an amount of pollicking. Like many others of his ilk, he wrote a somewhat uninspired and uninspiring book about it, uninspiring name among the Himalayas. The, the major was a normal sort of ch chappy and a sportsman, but his hunting was not for the feverish 91 gun and closet variety of today. Quite contrary, he would take a few birds of type and consider to be legitimate game for his pot and keep his eye in for the grouse sh shots. And his next, on his next home leave in Scotland, and he banged away at Tiger, whatever the local natives could rustle one up. Whenever one could, a locust rustle one up. But he was not scrambling about the Himalayas primarily for what we nowadays call sport. He was just puttering. The lost 19th century British art because he had some time off and the official sanction to make use of it as he would. Despite the limited intelligence attributed to the 19th century British Indi Army, Indian Army colonels, they were really the most remarkable breed, almost a uh, mutation for, from some hidden depths of their public school education and the remoter recesses of their ancient family traditions. They dredged up a wealth of wisdom and they often developed an extraordinarily keen interest in the world about them wherever they happened to land. Most of them were sort of mild philosophers. Many turned out to be brilliant linguists and a great, and great scholars. And they were often both leaders of men and students of animal life. They have been grossly maligned by almost everybody, laughed at at super blips, blimps, and neglected as historians. But if you will just read their munderings carefully, you will garter therefrom a trove of both literary and factual gems. Take this Major Wal Waldo Waldell, for instance, while pounding over one of the unpleasanter bits of Sikkim, that doesn't just not feel right, but it might be saying it right, but it don't feel right. I guess I should cook something, but I don't feel like it. Uh, Sikkim is believed to be 
a combination of limbo words Su Nu and Kim Palace or House. Sikkim is a state in Northeast India. And this is make sure I'm uh, pronouncing it right. Sikkim. What? A, <laughs> Sikkim boy, Sikkim boy. I, I just, uh, all right, what the hell? <laughs> Sikkim. Okay, so unpleasanter bits of Sikkim and vile weather. He came upon a set of tracks made by some creature walking on two legs and bare feet that he says went on and on over the freezing snow not only taking the line of least resistance at every turn but marking out a course in conformity with the easiest gr gradients that brought whoops of admiration even from the major's mountain-born porters he remarks almost casually upon this remarkable achievement and wonders vaguely not what manner of man, but what sort of creature could have made them and why it should have decided to cross this awful pass in the first place. The major did not realize when he penned this, though he, though this thought just what be was starting what he be, he was starting though starting it perhaps not the exact word to describe his remarks for what he recorded was already ancient history when Columbus sailed for the West Indies it just so happened that a far as popular recognition as concerned his was one of the earliest mentions to appear in print in the English language. It was at what may be called modern times uh, of what has literally become known as the abominable snowman. At that time, nobody in what we now call the Western world paid the slightest attention to this extraordinary report. At least as far as we know, it just went into the record as a statement, for one could hardly in the day and age call any pronouncement on the part of anybody with such notable honors a liar or even a traveler tale. It was therefore assumed that some religious chap must have preceded the uh, gallant major over the particular route and Samuel managed not to die of frostbite and sun blindness and starvation. It was remarkable that he had done a dash good uh, a dashed good job of negotiating the pass. There are matter there the matter rested. Major Waldell, Waldell's book was one of the many written about the end of the century when the Western world was complacently sure that it knew more or less everything about all countries with the possibility of exception of Tibet and the holy city of Mecca which it was then considered were rather unsporting and that they did not welcome civilized Englishmen. All sorts of sporting gentry went wand wandering about the fringes of the empire with rod and gun and later word about their experiences. 
and their effusions uh, were read by both the previous and the un upcoming generations of colonial, colonial excuse me, pioneers, but a few by few others. What they said was not taken too seriously by the general uh, non-empire building public. However, many of these gentry also submitted official reports on certain less publicized aspects of their activities to their superiors, and these were taken very seriously. Unfortunately, the great body of such reports are not published, and many of them are either lost in some archive or truly lost forever. There are others that are still top secret and unavailable, and so that their very existence is often conjectural. Yet every now and then one stumbles upon such a report that is extremely tantalizing. Tracking down the original is a frightful chore and one of the most time-consuming and frustrating experiences. One is balked with every turn, but not, I would stress, by any deliberate or organized defense on the part of the authorities. Official archives are preserved for the benefit of all and are open to inspection by all, and even the topmost secrets are in time released as mere historical objecta, objecta, with an A, ob, no, it's not, a D, it's not objecta, dejecta. What is dejecta? I assume I, dejection? Is that a way of saying that? Am I even saying that word right? Uh, dejecta. 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 Is it even a word? Do you make it up? It's a word. Dejecta. 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 I don't even know if that's right. So, um, now the next thing is, what does it mean? Right? Instead of assuming that we know what it means, I think we know what it means. But do I know what it means? I don't know what it means. We know deject. A waste discharged from the body and excrement. Dejecto. So it's just basically the same thing. It means the same thing. To eliminate, right? And to excrete to uh, a mere historical crap. It's basically the fancy way of saying historical crap. Okay. So if you hear dejecto, just think of crap. Okay. Okay. The trouble is simply that the original reporters, and more so those reported too, did not lay any store by or place any s specific value on esoterica or anything other than the primary matter at hand, which was often of a diplomatic and political nature, so that the items uh, that Interest most were most were never indexed and cataloged. You just have to plow through mountains of material quite extraneously uh, to you particular quarry and hope to stumble upon casual asides that are pertinent to it. But one does occasionally so stumble. Well, I didn't think this book was going to be so intellectual, but I'm so glad it is. Now I should state, without further ado, and quite frankly, I am prejudiced in favor of the, officials, the official as opposed to any other form of report and for the following reasons. 
in this country, we do not, let's face it, have much respect for the law or its potential until we have recourse to it and it requires our submission. Until we have been on the witness stand, almost all of us believe that perjury, which is simply a legal term for lying, and the law's, law's presence. So it should be the easiest thing in the world. But even those of us who say that, the, that laws are made only f to be broken soon find that it is not. Few think twice about telling a fish story uh, in the corner bar, but there are very few even congenital ideas who won't think before telling, excuse me, congenital idiots who won't think before telling in the court of law when therefore someone voluntarily makes an official statement, when there is no proof uh, profit motive involved, I have always felt it reasonable to assume that it is quite likely true. The British happen to have a particular respect for their law, and the British officialdom, despite what has been said about its colonial policies has always been remarkably altru altruistic. British consuls and uh, other officials just did not report a lot of rubbish to their service headquarters. Even paper was scarce and minor m British outposts, outposts and the field officers did not clutter up essential reports with bizarre trivia unless they consider them to be of real import. We approach, therefore, the following official report with a certain quota of, quota of awe. It appears that in 1902, British Indian officialdom was concerned with the stringing of the first telegraph line from uh, La, uh, La Sa, the capital of Tibet. <clears throat> La, La Sa? Well, we can always find out for once instead of assuming that we know it. Because it's, it's a different language. Uh, La Sa. La Sa. Uh, La Sa. So it's not the, the, the H is silent. So it's la, Lassa. 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 And I think I stumbled upon that word in the last reading, and when I mean I stumbled, I screwed up. So Lassa, the capital of Tibet, to Kal Limpong and Darjeeling in Bengal province in India, just south of uh, Sikkim. Border. Uh, I see map. Job entails first going into Tibet and then stringing the cable out. When the crew reached a pass named Chabitthang near a place called Jalepla on the Tibetan Shik Shik Sikkim border, an incident occurred that prompted an official report. A dozen workers failed to return to camp one evening and the military post posse was sent next day to search for them at the scene of their operation. No trace of the missing men were found, but the soldiers during their wide search for them found a remarkable creature asleep under a rock ledge, or so the report goes. The soldiers were Indians, not Gurk, Gurkhas, or mountain folk, and this is of significance because had they been, they would doubtless have acted differently. The Indians had no qualm about shooting this creature to death immediately. 
it proved to be human rather than animal in form, though covered with thick hair fur. Up to this point, the report is official. Then it becomes unofficial, but for one minor aside to the effect that a full report together with the beast was shipped to the senior British political officer, then re res resident in Sikkim, who is correctly named as one Sir Charles Bell. The unofficial sequence I take from this extraordinary book by John A. Keel entitled Jia Jadu. I didn't know he had that book called Jadu. Let's look that up. I like him. Jadu. There's one dude I like. It's John A. Keel. I like reading his books. And if they got it, oh, good. No, they don't. I don't think they do. I might. Jadu. Jadu. <clears throat> Let's put John Keel. Let's see if that helps. It might not, but <clears throat> get it on Amazon. Jadu. This is the more startling and that it even mentions an incident apparently lost and certainly forgotten over a half a century before, yet states that the information therein given was obtained firsthand. The author states that he met in 1957 in Darjeeling a retired Indian soldier named Bombadhar uh, Chitri, I guess that's pronounced his name, <clears throat> who claimed that he was among the party that killed this creature and that he personally examined it. He is also allegedly to have said that it was about 10 feet tall and covered in hair. Well, apparently you could shoot him then. But for a naked face and that it had long yellow fangs. Further, Mr. Keel says that Bamba Hadar Chitri told him that the carcass had been packed in ice and shipped to the same Sir Charles Bell, but that he did not hear anything further of it, nor apparently did Mr. Keel nor have I, though I have spent a lot more time and energy than the image might seem to warrant in a fruitless endeavor to trace further reports, official or otherwise. This is the more aggravating since it is the earliest report that I have found on the actual or even the alleged capture of any form of what we shall henceforth be calling an ABSM, i.e. the abominable snowman. But what we must also, for lack of any established overall name, call the Western world and the Oriental, or, or, Oriental region. Nevertheless, it is by no means the only such report, nor actually the earliest on record. For as we shall presently see, it was preceded by two, if not three other continents by just as definitive statement, statements as some cases as official, official ones that, at that. And this brings up another point that I should endeavor to clear up forthwith. I would have preferred to start this story where all stories should begin, 
which is to say at the beginning. However, despite the chronology that I have compiled over the years, such a procedure would be open to at least two serious defects. First, it is almost daily, and now with increasing tempo, being added to almost all along the line, while its origin are, origins are regressing even further into the recorded past. Second, it, it would be extraordinarily dry and o over formal in the eyes of any but extreme specialist. I have felt, therefore, that the history of this whole abominable snowman business will be much better understood if it is unfolded upon the chronology of its discovery and progress. A sort of history of a history. This is further herein recorded deliberately from what we call above a Western point of view is that it is a chronology, chronological record of how the matter was brought. <clears throat> okay, the term ABSM is coined from the best known name for one kind of those creatures of which we speak, namely abominable snowman. As is explained later, this term is incorrect, inappropriate, and misleading, even if, even in the case in which it first applied. Well, it cannot possibly be applied to at least 90% of all of the apparently most varied and quite different creatures involved, and now reported <coughs> from five continents the term Western world is the case as the culture rather than a regional sense. But by the or ori Oriental region, it is to be understood a very precise geographical unit. To the, at the attention of the Western world, this is, it would soon be seen and that a greater part of the discovery may have come to light in reverse. For instance, it has only been within most recent years that the earliest accounts have come to light and further research workers probe into the whole matter, the further back the origin of the whole ABSM affair recedes. While the wider does their distribution become both in fact and in report. Thus, in treating of the history of this matter, we must bear in mind that what appear to us to be discoveries are more nearly revelations because the majority of the world, which is, of course, non-Western, has to some degree or another known about the, the business for centuries while we have remained completely oblivious of or to it. For this reason, I divide our chronology into five stages and call these as follows. The ancient period prior to the 15th century expansion of Europe to the Dark Ages from 1500 to 1888. Three, the explorers from 1888 to 1922. For the mountaineers for 1920 to 1950, five that of the researchers from 1950 to 1960. All of this, however, applies primarily and most essentially to the Himalayan area of the Oriental region, wherein this business was primarily unfolded for us. The same peers, of course exist time elsewhere, such as North America, but they cannot be found on the same criteria or named after the same classes of un entrepreneurs. Behind the chronology and everywhere lies 
an immense period of what I call native knowledge. This trails off into dim mists of extreme past and into the folklore and myth, an area which is only just now being taken into account. As serious history rather than mere make-believe. Thus, in other parts of the world, our story has often jumped straight out of the native period into that of the scientific study. While, <clears throat> while the ABSMs were not only reported but also reported upon and even officially in our, our other parts of the world, um, world bid by Canada for long before the travels of Major Waldell, and while specimens, as it now turns out, are alleged to have been captured or killed long before that, we of the West became cognizant of these happenings and alleged happenings only very recently. Also, it is now it now transpires detailed and more properly critical information on the subject was even being published in Eastern Eura Eurasia centuries ago. For the instance, in Tibet, China, Mongolia, and Manchuria, and some reflection, and some reflection of this had filtered through to Europe as early as the Renaissance period, its Renaissance time, as an exemplified, as exemplified in certain curious statements in the works of Marco Polo. Millions of people were then talking about this as a matter of course, but the whole thing being completely foreign to Europe conditions or even thought at the time made it n n no impression upon what we now call the Western world until our fourth period, namely that of the mountaineers. Just how foreign it was prior to that period is clearly de demonstrated by the reception or lack of it given to report published in scientific journal preceding of the Zoological Society uh, of London in the year 1915 and the brief comments upon it made at the time. The report was re read before the society by a very well-known botanist and scientific explorer named Henry J. Elwes. 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 And consisted consisted of portions of a later a letter received by that gentleman from a forestry officer by the name of J. R. O. Gent, who was stationed in. Darjeeling, this read as follows. I have discovered an existence of another animal, but cannot make out what it is. A big monkey or ape, perhaps, if there were any apes in India. It is a beast of very high eva ele elevation and only goes down to fat loot in cold weather. It is covered with longish hair, face as hairy, also hairy, an ordinary yellowish brown color of the Bengal monkey. Stands about four feet high and goes about on the ground chiefly, though I think it can also climb. The peculiar feature is that its tracks are about 18 inches or two feet long and the two toe prints in the opposite direction to that which the animal is moving. <clears throat> the breadth of the tracks is about six inches. It can, it, 
it take I take it he walks on his knees and shins instead of on the soles of his foot he is known as the Jun Jungli Edmai or Sogpa. One was wearing a lot of what was wearing 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 a lot of coolies working in the forest below uh, Fat Lot in December. So one was wearing a lot of coolies working in the forest below Fat Lot in December. They were very frightened <coughs> and would not go <coughs> into work. I set off as soon as I could to try to beg the beast, but before I arrived, the forester had been letting off a gun and frightened it away, so I, was, I saw nothing. An old Chukar, Chukitar of Falud told me he has frequently seen them in the snowy and the snow there confirmed the description of the tracks. It is a thing that practically no Englishman has ever heard of, but all the natives of the high villages know about it. All I can say is that it is not a Nepal langer, but I have impressed upon the people up there that I want information the next time one is about. This is also the name of a known tribal group of people in the Rotem Valley of the Himalayas. This report, which would today probably cause quite a stir in certain circles, though for various and quite opposed op reasons, seems hardly even to have been commented upon. It would probably have been dismissed altogether and most likely not published in the proceedings had it not been read by such a person as elves like there's elves 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 if that's the pronouncer right it's with a w instead of v uh as it was the general impression left was that perhaps a new species of monkey had been found or some local folklore embellished, but unexpectedly, Henry Elvis then saw fit to make a statement of his own to the effect that in 1906, he had himself seen the same or similar creature in another part of the Himalayas. Most aggravatingly, he either did not give further details or they were not recorded at the time. And after he died, his notes were lost while no mention of the incident was to be found in any of his published writings. Zoologists were apparently quite impressed at the time because of the standing of elves, but the matter never got further than the close confines of professional zoology. It was moreover not until 1920 that an English-speaking public outside of the limited audience early served by the writings of travelers in the Orient was in any way made aware of the whole business. And as it is so often the case, it was even then more by accident than by design. This part of our story is most intriguing as well as being a sort of turning point in Western thinking, and not only upon this, but upon many other matters. But before dealing, before telling you the details of this little comedy, I just want to diverge a moment and impress upon you once again the fact that what then took place while well, a revelation 
was more peculiarly so to the Anglo-Saxon world. A, de a decade before, in 1907, a certain young zoologist named Valdemar A. Kauslov uh, started an ex to examine and survey, extend a survey of a similar manner throughout the central Euro Eurasia and submitted a long report on it to the Imperial Academy of Sciences in Russia. Netherlands authorities had been pestered with annoying to officialdom's reports of a like nature emanating from Sumatra. The French had undergone the same in Indochina and the Brazilians in their country, while even the British Columbia, both the courts and the crown itself had long been bothered by citizens seeking to make depositions on closely related matters. Thus, in retrospect, the happenings in 1920 lose a great deal of their import, if not of their impact. In that year, an accident, an in that year, an incident occurred that was impressive enough, but which might have been either wholly or temporarily buried, had it not been for a concentration of almost uh, piffling, piff, piffling, piffling, no, it's just piffling, piff, fling, piffling mistakes. In fact, without these mistakes, it is almost certain that the whole matter would have remained in obscurity and might even now be considered in an entirely different light or in the status of such other mysterious mysteries as that of sea monsters. This was a telegram sent by Lieutenant General, now Sir C.K. Howard Burry, who was on a reconnaissance expedition to the Mount Everest region. The expedition was approaching the northern face of Everest that it too that it too says from the Tibetan side and when at about 17,000 feet above on the Lahapkala Pass saw and watched through binoculars, a number of dark forms moving about on the snow field far above. It, looked, it took them some time and considerable effort to reach the snow field where these creatures had been, but when they did, so they found large numbers of huge footprints, which Colonel Howard Burry later stated were about three times those of normal humans, but which he nonetheless also said he thought had been made by a very large stray or gray wolf. The extraordinarily illogical phrasing of the statement will be discussed later on, but it should be creatures moving about not just a wolf, and that it is hard to see how the colonel could determine its color from its tracks. Furthermore, wolves cannot walk on two feet only, and as in any case, there are no wolves there. However, despite these expressions and the shepherd the Sherfer, the Sherper Porter with the expedition disagreed with them most firmly and stated that the tracks were made by a creature of man form to which they gave the name 
Mito Mito uh, Kang Mai Mito Kang Mai Kerr Harabury appears to have been intrigued by this scrap of what he seems to have regarded as local folklore, but like all who have had contact with them, he had such respect for the Sherpas that he included the incident in a report that he sent to Kathmandu, capital of Nepal. To be telegraphed on to his representatives, representatives in India. And this is where the strange mis mistakes begin. It appears that Colonel Howard Burry is noting the name given by the Shep Sherpa either mistranslated or miswrote it. He also failed to realize that he was dealing with one of the several kinds of creatures known to the Sherpas and that they, on this occasion, apparently, both in an endeavor and to emphasize this and for the sake of the clarity used as the gener generic term for all of them. The name Kang, Lang Kang Mai, which was a word foreign to their language. This is a Tibetan colloquialism in some areas and it itself is partly a foreign origin even there. And that Kang is apparently a Chinese origin while Mai is the form of Nepalese, Nepalese, uh, me, uh, me, so like that. The combination thus meant snow creature. His mota would better have been written meta, a name of which we shall hear much, and which turns out to mean me or man size ta or wild creature. However, the in Indian telegraphist then got in the act and either he dispatched this word as or as transcribed in India as mek, sketch, mek, sketch, mek, I think it mek. Uh, the recipients in India were unfamiliar with any of the, the languages and dialects of the area, but they were impressed by the fact that Harbury had taught or thought whatever it might be important enough to cable a report. So they appealed to a sort of font of universal wisdom for help. This was a remarkable gentleman named Mr. Her Henry Newman, who has for years written a most fascinating column in the Calcutta Statesman. On almost every conceivable subject, he or, and who has most incredible fund of information at his fingertips. This gentleman, however, did not really know the local language or dialects of the Eastern Tibet and Nepal either, but this did not deter him from giving an immediate translation of the Mek uh, Kemai, which he stated categorically was Tibetan for the abominable snowman. The result was like an explosion uh, of an atom bomb. Nobody, and notably the press, could possibly pass up any such delicious terms. They seized upon it with the utmost 
validity and bestowed upon it enormous mileage but almost without any anything concrete to report the british press gulped this gulped this up and the public was delighted then there came a, a lull in the storm during this time it now transpires a number of eager persons started a fairly systematic search for previous reports on those abominable creatures and they came up with sufficient to convince their editors that the story was not just a flash in the pan but a full-fledged mystery that had actually been going on for years thus the birth of the abominable snowman per se may be precisely dated as of 1920. As an once it was launched and it gathered momentum and as we shall see later when we come to examine the actual reports from the eastern Himalayan region almost everybody who went there and notably the mountaineers reported either seeing snowmen, their tracks, or hearing them, finding what I guess it carios or is that uh, I can't read that word as uh, C A carrions or I think I don't know and other objects. Well, maybe we'll find it later. These are carriers, maybe carriers, and other objects by them, and relating information secondhand uh, that they had gleaned from the native population. The business reached a crescendo in 1939 with the publication of several quite long accounts and books by well known and much respected explorers, such as Ronald. Colbeck. Then came World War II, and the matter faded into limbo, but it did not by any means stop. No sooner was the war over than, than the, the onslaught of Mount Everest was resumed, and along with this came a new approach to the ABSM affair. Everyone appears to have felt it's incumbent at least to mention the matter even if he could not contribute anything new or material to the story yet there were very few who did not have something concrete to offer and indeed I am unable to name one who didn't what is more, prior to World War II, this was an almost exclusively British affair, though there was a book on the first American uh, Karakoram expedition entitled Five Miles High that was most pertinent. It has now come become international as a result of not only the expedition expedition going on in the air from many nations and multinational compositions but also because of reports that came to light uh, but which were originally made during the war also for the first time reports by what may be called native frontiers began to appear. The whole subject of natives, in quotes, is a sorry one and it's rather muddling to Americans because to them it, it, it has several meanings, none of which is exactly synonymous with the terms as developed and understood among the British. It was the Declaration of Independence by 
the number of Asiatic nations that brought confusion and that while these peoples were manifestly native to their own countries, they suddenly became no longer natives, in quotes, and the, in the precise British sense. And so that what they said had to be accepted and assessed in an entirely new light, whereas while anything stated by such people prior to the war could have passed off as a mere native tale, or a story by some benign native. It, is, it had now to be treated with respect. <clears throat> As a, a statement by uh, a responsible citizen, what is more, an, an, an Indian traveling through Nepal to the pet also became just as much a foreigner as any Britisher, and in some cases, actually more so, because there were places where m more British Britishers had been living longer than any Na Indians. And this proved extremely awkward to the British at first, and it took about a decade even for their uh, phlegmatic genus I don't know what that means phlegmatic genus for uh, for comprise along with a fairly genuine common decency and belief in good matters to gain upper hand so I guess it's something probably you had to um, <clears throat> maybe you know Looking down at these people, now they're becoming almost like eagles, right? Uh, and it's phlegmatic. Phleg. Phlegmatic. Genius. What is a phlegmatic? What does phlegmatic mean? It's going gonna, it's gonna to bother me until I find it out. <clears throat> Phleg. Very medic. Very uh, English, having uh, an unemotional and stoically calm disposition, phlegmatic British character. Phlegmatic. Phlegmatic. Only a British would think of such a thing. <laughs> phlegmatic. Okay, phlegmatic. Despite the international scramble, it was, again, the British who attracted the world's attention uh, to the matter of uh, abominable snowmen. And it was still their mountaineers who did this. The most notable was Mr. Eric Shipton, who on still another reconnaissance, no, yeah, reconnaissance of the Everest block came up on a long set of tracks, not by any means for the first time in his life. And after following them for some distance, noting they were definitely bipedal, but nego nega uh, negotiated by almost impossible obstacles, ne negotiated by almost impossible obstacles that would be hard for even an experienced mountaineer to do, took a series of clear photos of them. These were published in the much respected Illustrated London News, not a publication given to elaborations, irresponsible reporting, portage, or the mounting of international jokes. This time, everyone had to take a matter seriously, and they did, but in a variety of ways. The public, as it is pragmatic, won't 
took it as its uh, its took it at its face value. The press literally howled. The explorers cheered a bit, but the scientists flew into a positive uh, tantrum, an altogether undignified profession, the effect of which has not yet worn off and will not do for many years. This was in 1951, and it marked the next turning point in the history of ABSM Murray's. Murray. Up till then, the matter had been primarily a Western and notably a British prerequisite. It had also been a child of the popular press with a sort of minor cold war going on between the mountaineers and the zoologists. Now, however, a new agency entered the picture. The polygot assortment of people of various bents that can only be termed the searchers. Since the turn of the century, there had con- continued to be outright explorers as well as putterers and sportsmen in the field, and not a few of these continued to stumble upon uh, uh, the uh, abominable snowmans, or tracks, or other evidence of their passing. And none of these, however, had any prior interest in the matter and like the mountaineers had been in Himalayas preliminary for other purposes. On the other hand, the whole affair was until Eric Shipton published his photos uh, relatively nothing more than a news gimmick though the press had had to tread warily with the reports made by prominent persons and especially the mountaineers engaged in the attack on Everest, which had officially backing, which had official backing. The scientific world had not been quite so circumspect. At the outset, it denounced the whole thing at first, as first a fraud and then a case of mistaken identity and it stuck with that story and it's just, it still in large part sticks to it today even to the extent of deliberately ridiculing such men as Shipton and Colbeck. Or Colbeck. Um, but after their completely unsuccessful attempt to set Shipston's 1951 finding at naught, which backfired with considerable public impact, a sort of revolution began within the ranks of the scientists. Some top-notch scientists, not just technicians and self-appointed experts, who happened to be employed by scientific organizations started to investigate the whole matter upon truly scientific principles. What is more, the scientists were primarily anthropologists as opposed to zoologists, and this was of an utmost significance for the latter had prominently closed the door on the whole question and when they could not prove that that it was a hoax stated flatly that all uh, ABSM tracks were made either by bears or monkeys. Also there were anthropological expeditions actually going into the field and these two began to report discoveries similar to those of the mountaineers. Notably among the field workers 
were Dr. Weiss uh, Dunat, Duant, because it's Weiss, not not, Duant, Dunat. Okay. Dr. Weiss Dunat of a Swiss expedition, Professor von uh, Forer Hamdendorf of the School of Oriental and African Studies, and in particular, Professor Rene von Neb Nebeski Wojkowski. Wojkowski. Nah, yeah. Wojkowski. Wojkowski. I don't even know how to pronounce these people's names. Nebaski ne, ne Wo Cowswit. Cowswit. Sorry, I'll just go over an A bump about that. <laughs> Among these uh, not engaged in field work were Dr. W. C. Osmond Hill, then the Zoological Society of London in England, Dr. Bernard Havel, Havelman's. Uh, Belgium zoologist, and <clears throat> you think I'd be able to say that name? It's half Belgium, I can't even say that. Uh, Bernard Hall, Hall Belgium zoologist in Paris, and later, later, a whole group of Russian scientists led by Professor B. F. Porshnov. Porshnov. Uh, it was the press, however, that was in the end first in the field with an expedition aimed primarily at the ABSMs. This was organized. I don't know why. Just it's easier just to say abominable snowman. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just gonna say abominable snowman. I know, I think they, they don't want us, they want to get us out of that, but it's not easier to say Abominable Snowman than ABSM for me. So, Abominable Snowman. This was the was organized by the Daily Mail in London and went to the Himalayas in 1954. It was a curious outfit and it was not very successful, but it initiated a new phase in the history of this mystery. Um, it was led by a reporter, Ralph Izzard, and had among its members a professional zoologist, Dr. Uh, Biswas of Calcutta, and also a man named W. M. Gerald Russell, Gerald Russell, who, whose experience was of great significance though nobody seemed to have realized it at the time. However, it was once again directed by mountaineers. The significance of this escapes everyone then and to a very great extent still does. <clears throat> the universal impression had been gained over the years that the abominable as then supposed snowman whatever it may be was a denizen of the snowfields and therefore inhabited the uppermost slopes of the Himalayas as a result its pursuit was looked upon primarily as a mountaineering job and was therefore given to the professionals and the experts in the field of sport. The idea of including a scientist, and especially a zoologist, had never occurred to anybody previously. The idea of including a man with a p the p p particular skills and experience, as well as training, as Gerald Russell, had not, yet, had not even yet, it seems, dawned upon anyone. Russell alone, among the whole army of investigators, is really the only man qualified to tackle the problem, for he is a professional collector, which is something absolutely different from either hunters 
are sportsmen. On the one hand, a, a, or researcher, research scientists on the other. And then again, no ABSM is a denizen of any snowfield. Naturally, and as should be obs obvious to any sane person on a moment's consideration, for in such place, places there is nothing to eat. I'll, <coughs> I'll turn out uh, to inhabit dense mountain forests. Thus, just about the last person suited to search for them are mountaineers who have a, po a positive passion for climbing mountains above all else. It should be pointed out, while sportsmen and hunters are little better for other than even more obvious reasons. <clears throat> this is a somewhat sensitive question, but one of first importance. The techniques developed over the ages for hunting are basically aggressive. Be any they noisy as in beating or silence as in stalking. Further, the dog, which is not only a domestic but an actual and artificial animal, has been extensively used in hunting. And these methods obtain the quickest results and the largest amount of what is specifically desired. Collecting, on the other hand, should best be almost entirely passive. Silence is one of the features in, in certain of its aspects, but almost as much noise is permissible as in hunting in certain circumstances. To obtain animals not normally hunted, the less ground covered, the better, but not longer, but the longer the collector must sit and wait for the animals to become used to his presence. The noises he makes and the uh, effluvias, what the hell is that? Effluvia? And the effluvia. Hmm. What is effluvia? I have an idea, but I never heard of that one. Uh, e F F L U V I A. What is effluvia? An effluvium, an unpleasant or harmful odor. Oh, I'm assuming that uh, a secretion or discharge. Effluvia. Effluvia, okay. Effluvia. That'd be a good name of a dark punk band. Effluvia. It's you, um, and the effluvia he gives off in uh, the normal course of living. As many artificial things as possible must be eliminated, and most notably dogs. Metal, especially metal Clean, clean, uh, cleaned with material, mineral oils uh, such like that are uh, not indigenous to the wild. A given time any wild creature however timid will come to investigate the collector whereas it will fly before the hunter long before it, it is detected. Every zoologist unless they have had extensive collecting experience in the field are a little better for the <clears throat> for the poor souls are hustled about every by everybody else into or out of the least likely areas for proper investigation and are in any case supplied in advance with a sort of book of rules that goes far to negotiating the search 
for anything that is not already known. <clears throat> the Daily Mail expedition did nonetheless include among its ranks and deliberately a very experienced zoologist with field experience in the form of Dr. Biswas, Biswas and quite fortuitously in the person of Gerald Russell, the first and only man on any ABSM expedition train to tackle such a collecting pro problem. It also accomplished something else in that it publicized the whole matter and served notice to everyone that the press was no longer over <clears throat> awed by what they had termed scientific opinion but from them on took the affair for a granted as having graduated from the category of the silly sense filler in fact the pointed way was some serious endeavor designed to try to solve the mystery this challenge was taken up by quite a new type of operator the daily mail expedition returned in 1955 and in the same year an Argentine mountaineering expedition and another British party of a Royal Air Force Alpinus uh, reported having encountered tracks and other evidence of abominable snowmen. The following year, John Keel already mentioned made his trip through the country and, uh, and stated in his book published in 1958, tracked and sighted the abominable snowman. At the same time, the Russians uh, were conducting investigations and getting ready to make a concrete attack upon the problem. There were almost quite a number of other in the field, and while the few serious students at home began to bring to light all manner of related items from the past, the busiest of these scientific sleuths and the most open-minded and best informed was the zoologist Dr. Bernard Havelmans, who had for long specialized in collections and examinations of evidence for the existence of any creatures as yet unknown to or unidentified by zoologists. It was he, moreover, who first brought the findings of the Hollanders in East Indies and the French in the Indochina and to a very considerable extent that of South Af America, Americans explorers to light. The American edition of the finding by findings by Hal Halvelman's on the trek to the unknown animals was published by Hill and Wang in New York in 1958. However, the most significant personality to enter the field was the prominent Texan, Mr. Thomas B. Slick. Before we go any further with that, <clears throat> let's see if I can find this book on the track of unknown animals. Uh, on the track of unknown hope I'm spelling things right. I don't know about you, I type and I don't look at the keyboards. I just feel it. And there it is. They got it. I know these are old books, and 
a lot of people say that that's not, it's not worth a damn, but um, it is worth a damn. If I'm discovered. It just about in any field of study, you have to go back in the past for something that's happened to us in this past generation or two. So. I don't know what it is. Uh, maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm just not around the right people. Which is, well, that's, I mean, I'm definitely not around anybody, so. Tom Slick, as he was known to everybody and all over the world, was a most remarkable man. To Americans, he was probably the best known f because of the airline that carries his name which it itself is a natural advertisement which is amusing connotations in the English language. Uh, then, in the world of commerce, he was widely known for his position in the mysterious world of oil and the very down-to-earth world of beef. But his international reputation is based on his extraordinary effort to, in the cause of world peace. Tom Slick did many other things and was not only a patron of but a driving force in many purely scientific endeavors. He established the second largest private endowment research unit in the world in the form of the Southwest Research. It says here, Mr. S uh, so Slick was killed in an airplane crash in Montana in 1962. That sucks. So the Southwest Research Institute near his home, town in San Antonio, and adjacent to this another large organization for educational promotion. I am often asked to describe this man and my response is invariably the same. Namely, that any, namely to say simply that for all his activities and the vastness of his outlook and the efforts he is less like to uh, the popular concepts of the Texas, Texan than anyone I have ever met. What? So his activities vastly outlooked and his efforts, he is less like the popular conception of a Texan, okay, than anybody I've ever met. Tom Slick it did anything and every fortunate very fortunately he became in, intrigued with the excuse me. Tom Slick did things and very fortunately he became intrigued with the business of Obama Snowman's. Despite a ridicule, especially among many of those closest to him, he set to work upon it uh, with a determination that he, almost alone in the Western world, it seems, was capable of and willing to apply. I speak of Tom Slick at length because it is, it was he and he almost alone, who by his quite persuasion uh, heaved this whole irksome business out of a sort of ten ring international circus into the realm of serious scientific endeavor, while he also simultaneously stimulated others in England, France, Italy, and India, and elsewhere to work on the problem by means of personal contacts and by the exercise of a sympathetic encouragement. Finally, he did one more thing. This was to break out of the confined limits of the Himalayas, Himalayan area of the or Oriental region, and direct attention and proper effort uh, to other parts of the world such as California which are proving to be very every bit as important 
in regards to the ABSMs. If not much more significant than even uh, the uplands of Eurasia, he began his own personal investigations by a trip to the Himalayans region in 1957. In 1957, Tom Slick, all, all together with F.K. Johnson, mounted the first full-fledged exhibition uh, expedition to the Himalayas for the specific and sole purpose of investigating uh, ABSMs. This says an extremely fortuitous. This saw the extremely fortuitous bring bringing together of Gerald Russell and the brothers Peter and Brian 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 really Brian Brian all right or is it burn uh, I call Brian Brian what a name Brian Burn. That's what Peter Burn and, and, and Brian Burn. What am I saying? And it was the happiest event that had until then happened to ABSM Murray. <laughs> For the first time in history, the leadership was not given to mountaineers or hunters, but to persons with collecting experience who believed that the quarry was real and was multiple in form and that in all its forms it lived in the forest as opposed to on to, uh, upper snow fields. As a result, this expedition came closer to obtaining concrete results than any other before and produced more straight evidence of the existence of such creatures than all the other expeditions put together. For details, see chapter 12. In the same year, however, the Soviet Academy, Academy of Science had established a special commission to coordinate the findings of several groups who had been working on the problem in countries within the Soviet sphere. These workers had brought to light the astonishing reports of the, of Ka, uh, Ka, what? Oh, this has got to be Russian. Kok loves, Kok, Kok, Halov, Kokolov made in the Academy in 1914 but which had been shelved, and they had before them the current report of uh, Dr. Pronin, a, a hydrologist of Leningrad University who alleged he had seen an ABSM in the uh, Pamirs. Pamirs, is that part of this? Uh, they had wealth of material from the Mongolian People Republic and a lot from China, and they had decided to mount proper scientific expeditions to investigate. Uh, these were for a number uh, and were put into the field of, uh, in 1958, one to the Caucasus where a creature named the Wild Man had been rumored for centuries, and one in the north, north face of the Everest block, one in, to the Mongolian region, and one to the Par Pamirs, which for certain odd reasons they considered to be the breeding grounds of the uh, ABSMs. Meanwhile, they started the publication of their overall findings in the forms of booklets. See chapter 13 and 14. And concurrently with this, a series 
of studies on fossil men, and particularly Neanderthalers, who also a wealth of uh, previously unpublished material, some historical and some current, appears in certain Russian magazines, notably and it's a uh, tech, Naika, Moledi, Moledi, so high. <laughs> Whatever, I don't know. It's a foreign language to me for sure. These Soviet activities shed an entirely new light on the whole business and also put it on such an altogether higher plane that Western scientific circles were obligated to change their attitude towards the matter quite drastically. No longer could they simply avoid the issue by saying that it had been explained or that it, its protagonists were merely a bunch of amateur enthusiasts pursuing a fantasy. At the same time, a certain nervous irritation was to be detected in the pronouncements because the press just then began harping on the case of the um, uh, co fuck, you know what they're talking about. Um, I can't say the damn word here. Fuck. So embarrassing. I hit a word, and I've heard that there's words. It doesn't matter what it is. I could read it a hundred times, and I come about to it again, and I can't. I can't say it, and, it's, and I just can't say it. I can't even put the word. C, lacanth. Celacanth. So celacanth. So. Duh. Uh, of the coelacanth fish discovered off the southeast coast of South Africa, this had at first been called a hoax, but had finally had to be accepted as living proof of the fact that not everything about the life of this planet is known. Obviously, creatures confidently thought to have been decently extinct for 10, 10 million years for tens of millions of years, can still be around. Further, it was the Russians who first stressed, uh, though perhaps more by inference, something that those scientists in the West who had been taking the matter seriously had been harping on for some time. This was that the whole problem is an anthropological rather than a zoological matter. Get their people, some kind of people. In other words, all the Sino Soviet evidence pointed to ABMS as being primitive hominids, men rather than uh, uh, pogens or, or apes. Like pungens? Pung, pungids. It is pungids. Another non human. Uh, creatures. Did I get that wrong right? Thus linking them with known fossil forms such as gyo, uh, Gigantopithecus Gigantopithecus and the P. Uh, Pithocanthropenes The Pithocanthropenes I, I can't help it. It's just it's, 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 it's all blurry. And especially the Neanderthals. Um, of course, I could blame it all on the third. But I suck at reading and talking to you. And in doing this, they also emphasize another point. That was the now very obvious but totally ignored fact that there is not just one creature called the Abominable Snowman, but a whole raft of creatures described almost all over the world of very considerable variety and as, as many as three distinct types 
in the Tibetan Himalayan area alone. This suggestion was, of course, not merely obnoxious, but positively horrific to the orthodox scientists who were still uh, vehemently denying even the possibility of the existence of even one such entity. Then the final bombshell landed. At this point in my narrative, I must confess to a considerable embarrassment since I must speak uh, in the first person and I do this with much uh, diffidence. Defend, defendence. 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 Okay. Struggle on. I got nothing else. Okay. Uh, these Soviet activities shed an entirely new light on the whole business and also put on such an altogether higher plane then Western scientific circles was obligated to change their attitude towards the matter quite drastically. No longer could they simply avoid the issue by saying that it had been explained or that it was its protagonists, protagonists were merely a bunch of amateur enthusiasts pursuing a fantasy. At the same time, a certain nervous irritation was uh, uh, to be detected in their pronouncements because uh, the press could then begin harping on the case of the um, uh, oh, coelacanths. I remember that it's, that O is silent. Coelacanths, fish discovered in the southeast coast of South Africa. South Africa. This had at first uh, been called a hoax, but had finally had to be accepted as living proof of the fact that not not everything about the life of this planet is known. Obviously. Creatures confidently thought of as being decently extinct for 10,000 years can still be around. A further, it is the Russians who first stressed, though perhaps more by inference, something that those scientists of the West who had been ta taking the matter seriously had been harping on for some time. This was that the whole problem of anthropological uh, rather than zoological matter. In other words, the Sino-Soviet evidence pointed to it as being a primitive human. Okay, we read all that. Uh, that's right. <clears throat> Maybe it's a good idea to read again. Uh, the linking with to them with known fossils forms such as Gigo uh, G -G Gigantopithecus and uh, Pithecanthropus Thropins, pith, pith, I can't throw pins, uh, uh, especially in the Anastoles. And in doing this, they also emphasized another point that was now very obvious, but totally ignored the fact that there is not just, okay, we read all that. There's a bunch of them, okay. In 1958, I received, that's where it's supposed to be, okay. Sorry about that. In 1958, I received a number of reports of an ABSM in California. At first, this sounded quite balmy even to us. And we are used to the most outrageous things and got itself filed among what we called Fortian, uh, like Fort, uh, Charles, Charles Fortian, Charles Fort, Fortiana which is to say those damnable and unacceptable items of the category, cat categories collected by the late Charles Fort. However, it so happened that I was privileged 
to spend a year, 1959, touring the North American continent, gathering material for a book on its geology, topography, a veget- a vegetational uh, cover, and wildlife. Before leaving, I had a research specialist, Stanley I. Rove, who, with, with whom I had a long been associated, prepare for me from his files, from ours and from other sources, the details of any and all oddities and enigmas reported from this continent by state and providence. These I investigated as a news news reporter as I went along. And when I came to Northern California, I fell fell into the most extraordinary state of affairs that I have, have ever encountered in my life. This was no idle rumor, but a full-fledged mystery and a straight-out, down-the-line, hard-boiled news story. This I tell in detail in Chapter 6. So suffice it to say here that I found three clear and most convincing evidence of the existence of the form of an ABSM of the most outstanding qualities, but worst was to follow for prompted by this astonishing discovery, I went aside the British Columbia to investigate their long-renowned Sasquatch only to find that it was just as definite and apparently identical to these O Moths or Bigfoot of California. Subsequent research has, and what is more, brought to light the mass of other reports of similar things from Quebec and the uh, Canadian Northern uh, West Territories, the Yukon, the Idaho Rockies, Washington, and Oregon. This brings us up to the date of writing, except to note that a large Japanese expedition went in in 1959-60 to the Himalayas specifically to to search the uh, ABSMs while there were other expeditions in the area in Sumatra and in California fitted uh, fitted out for the purpose. Finally, later this year in 1960, Sir Edmund Hillary, backed by American sponsors and with Merlin Perkins, director of the Lincoln Park Zoo in Chicago, accompanied him as zoological expert conducting an expedition to the Eastern Himalayas Himalayas with this pursuit as the second objective, major objective. And then there's supposed to be something here, uh, uh, but there's nothing there. These affairs in our Northwest were summarized in two articles in the True Magazine, October 1959, and January 6, January 1960, a set of whole new phase of ABS Emery's in motion. Uh, Ubiquitous Woodman, Woodsman, reports from Canada, 1860 to 1920. In my open remarks in the previous chapter, I said that I was going to tell the story to the chronology of discoveries made by the Western world starting about the year 1860. Rather than according to the straight historical chronology, having briefly outlined these discoveries from that date up to this year, I landed up in northwestern corner of North America. I now find that this is just the place where I have the 
um, have to commence my detailed reporting and for several reasons. By way of explanation, I resort to a map, one, a procedure that I am afraid you will discover I nearly always do. <coughs> ABSMs have now been reported from several dozen areas scattered all over five of the continents. At first sight, this distribution does not appear to make any sense at all. This is a misconception, but to go into the whys and wherefores thereof at this juncture would not only be exhausting, but more or less incomprehensible. Nonetheless, one cannot just go barging off all over the world reporting on this and that, both in time and space, without some ordered plan. Uh, skipping around and back and forth all over oceans just to point out similarities would be altogether aggravating. Some orderly procedure is therefore called for and very fortunately there is a ready-made one that will serve many purposes. This is to adopt the travelogues approach starting out from some specific point and visiting all the other necessary points and ending up where we begin. Doing this in the pursuit of the ABSMs just happens to be most convenient and for a number of reasons if we take Northwestern America as our starting point we will be able to dispense with a great deal of verbal garbage and duplication. I therefore pursue, propose to take you on a journey <clears throat> from Western Canada south through the Americas to Pan, Pan, uh, Patagonia then back up to the southern edge of the Amazon Basin then hop over to the Atlantic, to West Africa, and proceed through, or rather around the Congo Basin, and over the eastern uplands to the forest coastal lands of the East Africa. Africa. From there, we will jump over the Indian Ocean to the island of Sumatra, proceed from there up to uh, Malay Peninsula to the main body of the Great Indochina Peninsula, then turn straight left in uh, As Sam, or is it, I said pronounced, spelled right, or is it Asian? Left in, it's A S S A M, is that what it is? Assam? But I don't think that's proper. I don't think it's, anyways. And travel along the Himalayas to the vast. Parmas, Pamers, 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 Mers. I'm going to call them Parmers, Parmers. And on southwest through P Persia to the uh, Caucasus, to the Caucasus. Caucasus. This will be a turn about point from which we will return east to the Parmas, on to uh, Kun Kunlun's, uh, then to the Ten Shans, Alatu, Atlas, Sayans, I just his name I'm not used to. From there, we will go south through the uh, Kanganese, and all over the uh, El Shan Desert to the Neshan and onto the mountains of Sh uh, Switz, Schwick, 
Swekin, Swekwan, Sechwin. I don't know how to pronounce this. Switch, um, like Switzerland, switch, switch one. Here we will be another turnabout point from where we will go north again through the um, Tinslings or the Ordors of uh, Kingan, King Ends. I, these are, I don't even know where these places are. Uh, in the last lap of our way home, we will be following a lot more than ABSMs, and in following these, we will cross over the Bering Strait to and through Alaska and the Yukon back to our starting point in British Columbia, and specifically. A small place named Yell on the middle of on the middle of the Fraser River. It was near this place that something frightfully important happened in the year 1884. On the morning of July 3rd, as a matter of fact, the gorge of the Fraser narrowing along the stretch, so that rock wall tower on either side. Today, two railroads and the main west to east Canadian highway squeezes through this point and a little town of Yale clings to the banks of the river on one side. It is dotted about a narrow meadow on the other. I'm sure things have changed a little bit since then. <clears throat> Imagine that you know 130. How is it now? 134, 130 years ago, 140 years. Things change just drastically. It's just me watching. I mean, for six years, the places that I've seen um, uh, Bigfoot structures and um, Bigfoot uh, changed drastically, just in development and everything. Everything is overdeveloped. I wish I could live somewhere out in the country again. <laughs> I don't like all the... I like open spaces. Gosh darn it. I think we all do. We all like some green... They're green around us and trees. I mean, thank goodness we still have our old trees here, but... Shit. It's like... It's just development, development. It's just... I don't know where these people get their money. Honestly, we have a strange economic system. That's what I think. Anyways, where are we got with all this? This place is important. The importance. Of course, you know, they're down to yell. It clings to the ring. Since I beg to be regarded exclusively as a reporter for the duration of the forthcoming journey. The best thing for me to do is to quote the original report on what happened there on that day. This goes as follows, as taken from the Victoria newspaper, the Daily British Colonist. Yale, B.C., July 3rd, 1884. In the immediate vicinity of number four tunnel situated some 20 miles above the village are bluffs of rock which have hitherto been unsurmountable but on Monday morning last were successfully sealed by Mr. Adordunk Dunk's employees on a regular train from Lighten, assisted by Mr. Costerton, the British Columbia Express Company messenger, a number of gentlemen from Lighten and points east of <clears throat> that place, after considerable trouble and perilous climbing, captured a creature who may truly be called half man and half beast. Jacko. 
as the creature has been called by his captors is something of a gorilla type standing about four feet seven inches in height and weigh about 127 pounds he has long black strong hair and resembles a human being with an exception he is entire body excepting his hands or paws and feet are covered in glossy hair about one inch long. His forearms is much longer than a man's forearms and is, possesses extraordinary strength and he will take hold of a stick and break it by wrenching or twisting it. which no man living could break in the same way. Since his capture, he is very reticent, only occasionally uttering a noise, which is half bark and half growl. He is, however, uh, becoming daily more attached to his keeper, Mr. George Talbury. Of this place, who proposes shortly starting for London, England, to exhibit him. His uh, favorite food so far is berries, and he drinks fresh milk with uh, evident relish. By, uh, by advice of Dr. Han Hannington, raw meat has uh, been withheld from Jacko as the doctor thinks it would have a tendency of making him savage. The mode of capture was as follows. Ned Austin, the engineer, and on coming in sight of the bluff at the eastern end of number four tunnel saw what he supposed to be a man lying asleep at close proximity to the tracks. And... As quick as thought blew the signal to apply the brakes. The brakes were instantly applied, and in a few seconds the train was brought to a standstill. At this moment, the supposed man sprang up and uttering a sharp, quick bark, began to climb the steep bluff. The conductor, R. J. Craig, express messenger, uh, Cor Co Coasterton, uh, followed by a baggage man and brake man, jumped from the train, knowing they were some 20 minutes ahead of time, and immediately gave chase. After five minutes of per per um, perilous climbing, and then supposed. Uh, the supposed demented Indian was corralled on, corralled, corralled on a projecting shelf of rock where he could neither ascend nor descend. Uh, the quarry now was bowed, bowed or how to f capture. The quarry now ha was how to uh, capture him Okay, the query now is how to capture him alive, which was quickly decided by Mr. Craig, who crawled on his hands and knees until he was about 40 feet above the creature. Taking a small piece of loose rock, he let it fall, and it had the desired effect of rending poor Jackal incapable of resisting for a time, at least, and the bell rope was then brought up, and Jackal was now lowered uh, to terra firma. <clears throat> After binding him and placing him in a baggage car, off brakes and was sounded, and the train started for Yale. At the station, a large crowd who had heard 
of the capture by a telephone from Spoo's Zoom flat were assembled and each one anxious to have the first look at the monstrosity. But they were disappointed as Jacko had been taken off of the machine sh shops and placed in charge of his present keeper. The question naturally arises, how came to, how came the creature were, were it first seen? I don't know, I'm sorry about that. The question actually was, how can, a cane? Or how, I, I think it might be. <clears throat> how came the creature where it was first seen by Mr. Austin from bruises about its head and body apparent uh, soreness since its capture it is supposed suppose that Jackal ventured too near the edge of the bluff slipped and fell and lay there where found until the, the, the uh, sound of the rushing train aroused him. Mr. Thomas White and Mr. Uh, Gowan, CBE, as well as m uh, Mr. Major, who kept a small store about two miles west of the tunnel during the past two years, have mentioned having seen a curious creature at different points between Camp 13 and 17, but no attention was paid to their remarks as people came to the conclusion that they had either seen a bear or straight Indian dog. Who can unravel the mystery now that now surrounds Jacko? Does he belong to a species hitherto unknown in this part of the continent, or is he really what the train men first thought he was a crazy Indian? Now, whatever you may think about the press, you can't just write off anything and everything reported by that you don't like, don't believe in, and don't want. Further, to a newspaper man, this report is excellent. Being factual, given names that were obviously clearly checked, even the titles such as the CBE of Mr. Gowan, or Gouin, depending on I guess. I'm going to say Gouin. And hardly being at all speculative. In fact, it is really a model report and one that some present day newsman might well emulate. Then the persons concerned were not a bunch of citizens whose names only to identify them, they were mostly people with responsible positions who must have been widely known at the time throughout the area. For the railroad played a very important part in the opening up and development of the lower British Columbia. The reporter, moreover himself, took a very common sense view of the business when he inquired what manner of creature this might be and stated flatly that it was completely human but for being covered with silky black hair and having uh, exceptional strength in his arms the something <clears throat> it's missing a letter s okay the s9 options for others such as that the similar if not identical creature seen before might have been a bear or a stray Indian dog. Our reported straight and without a uh, festuous comment. The whole thing cannot in fact be lightly dismissed and therefore has to be most seriously considered. The story has been publicized for some 50 years now and so that aficionados, aficionados of uh, 
ABS Emery can often almost quote it verbatim, but although I must here class myself among these reportably uh, limpets, I wish to put on record one thought about it that has always stayed with me. This stemmed from a comment made by another paper shortly after the original story was published, and which asked quite without facetiousness uh, 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 I'm going to have to learn how to make sure I'm pronouncing that right. Like, uh, very immature 55 year old. That's why I'm still 55. Festuousness. Festuousness. Am I computers slowing down? Festuousness. Okay, I, so I'm saying it right. I just need now to just make sure I'm getting the meaning right. <clears throat> What's the difference between festuousness and sarcasm? Sarcasm. Fantastic. What is the difference between festuousness and sarcastic? Either festuousness, festuous, I'm not saying they're right, festuous, or sarcastic. Festuous. Festuous. Comments are meant literally, um, but an aim of festuous. This is humor. Neither fe festuous or nor sarcastic comments are meant literally, but are aimed for festuousness and humor. Is humor. Sarcasm involves cutting or sneering remarks that have mocking architectures, undertones, in short. Uh, Now, did I actually say it right? I know we're supposed to be learning about Bigfoot, but I'm learning how to fucking read and also uh, talk. Uh, I always had a struggle with it anyways, to be honest with you, but the MS really put it and really tanked it. I mean, we really suffer a lot from it, wasn't it? For some reason, my computer is so slow. Facetiousness. Facetiousness. Why? Facetiousness. Why did I... Facetiousness. I feel so stupid. Facetiousness. I feel so stupid. I am so stupid. Facetiousness. I call it facetiousness, and it's facetiousness. <laughs> and I've heard that a million times, and I'm like, why can't I say it? Okay. Without... Facetiousness, also, but with a slight air of mystification. How anybody could suggest that this jacko could have been a chimpanzee uh, that had escaped from circus? This little aside puts the whole affairs, the whole affair, in the remarkably vivid light. For we tend to forget that. It was penned 75 years ago in a country that was then only recently connected with the rest of the world. Also, it was written before a paleontologist had demonstrated that the true monkeys and more so apes, the, the uh, pogans or pa pongans, 
uh, never have existed in the Western Hemisphere. This creature was captured and it is absolutely sure that it existed in captivity for some time. A reporter in 1946 interviewed an old gentleman in Lytton, B.C., who remembered having seen it. It was not human, yet it was more than it was anything else. It had definitely been captured on the Fraser River, therefore there had to be some explanation of how it got there and what it was. The standard answers to the questions today would undoubtedly be that it was one, a hoax, or two, a cross through uh, between what and what would doubtless be suggested. Three, a throwback, and probably an Indian one. And then four, a little boy who had been lost years before a hunting trip, before on a hunting trip, and either managed to survive all uh, on his own and been fed by wolves. Five, a mentally defective glandular case from uh, an institution, or six, a, and most likely of all, an ape escaped f from a bankrupt circus. Surprisingly, the locals and even hard-boiled newspapermen of the time did not indulge in any of these latter-day foibles. Rather, they asked a straight question on popoed and poo-pooed any outliner suggestions that it was a chimp escaped from the, the circus. They even inquired as to whether it might be a very primitive form of human and an as yet unidentified species of great ape, in either case indigenous to the area. I may be properly accused of harping on this case, but I think that of almost all ABSM reports, it is perhaps the most cogent. It took place just within the age of reason. Today, perhaps rather a misnomer in a country then inhabited and being opened up by a most extremely pragmatic Westerners of predominantly hard-headed Anglo-Saxon stock at a time when there was little call for phony sensationalism. It was not just a report of tracks or other secondary items, nor even of an alleged sighting. It was a clear and defi definite account of a capture by known people with all the witnesses needed for confirmation. Quite apart from anything else, it alone sets a not the constant refrain, well, we haven't ever seen, ever caught one. Well, there we did, we did caught one. We caught one in 18, <clears throat> 18 what? Just get that date, if I can rem be rem even remember it. Uh, I'll go back another page. 1884, so it's an important date. 1872 is a great fire, uh, Chicago fire. It not only burned Chicago, but Wisconsin and Michigan and part of Canada and Windsor. But 1884, Yale. Now, if you just remember where I was at. So, the, uh, uh, there we go. So, there was, never was, there was one. It's caught in 1884. A hundred and forty years ago. 
This is by no means the only ABSM that has been caught, but it is the only one that I know of that was caught by what we must call, for lack of a better phrase, Westerners. And it is this culture that is the most skeptical and the most stubborn and at, at the same time the most interested. Of course, the most aggravating part of the business is that there is no proper end to Jacko's story and no physical evidence of his existence has come down to us, at least as far as anybody so far knows. What actually happened is not recorded. The only inkling that I have traced being a remark by Mr. Stephen or Stephen Franklin, staff writer of the Weekend Magazine, in his excellent article dated April 4, 1959, in which it is stated, and I, and I quote, that the editor of the Inland Sentinel and opportunely chose this month the one in which Jackal was captured to hump his newspaper and his press up the canyon from uh, Yale to Kamloops and did not publish the edition for several weeks. This statement is itself a kind of non sequitur since sequitur, non sequitur since the original reports come from the Daily British Col Colonist of Victoria. I made somewhat extensive search of any series on the forlorn Jacko in a Yale paper of old, but was unable to unearth even the Morgue of the Inland Sentinel, which moved to Canlopes. The Morgue. The Morgue? Morgue? <clears throat> yeah, I guess I'm learning how to learn to read. I didn't realize how bad I, and also learning how bad of a writer I am too. I guess it's part of educating myself, one way or the other. <clears throat> the morgue, Margu. Morgue. Okay, and even the morgue of the uh, inland sentinel witch, boo to Cam Loops. Jacko has said to tell just drop out of the news without apparently further comment, perhaps the most enigmatic figure ever to appear in the pages of the history and potentially one of the most important. Would that we would that we could unearth the end of the story and learn what did happen to him, for he must have either one escaped to died or three being killed and the two last events it is possible that some part of him may have been preserved and <coughs> be lying either in somebody's attic trunk or in, in a museum and do not for a moment get the idea that the latter is impossible Jacko however is not just an isolated imp <coughs> that suddenly appeared upon the scene and then disappeared. Before his capture, either he or one of his species had been reported <clears throat> from the same area by Mr. Alexander Caulfield Anderson, a well-known explorer and an executive of the Hudson Bay Company who was doing a survey of the newly opened territory and seeking a feasible trade route through it for his company. He reported just such hairy hominids as having hurled rocks down upon him and his surveying party from more than one slope. <clears throat> that was in 1864. Many years later, Mr. J.W. Burns, on retur ret 
now retired and living in San Francisco, who had devoted a lifetime to the study of this business, unearthed an old <clears throat> Amer Arm Indian Armer uh, Amer Indian woman from Port Douglas that had they had that Douglas at the head of Harrison Lake uh, met f uh, f eleven who alleged and brought some second uh, seconders to confirm that she had been kidnapped by one of these creatures in the year 1871 and kept by, and kept by it for a year, but finally returned by it to her tribal homestead because she aggravated it so much, though she said it had treated her with every consideration. The old lady died in 1840 at the age of 86. When abducted, she was 17 years old and was, she stayed forced to swim the Harrison River by the, the ABSM and then carried by him to a rock shelter where uh, its aged parents dwelled. This account comes from Mr. Burns, who had for years enjoyed the confidence of this retiring um, Amirid <clears throat> uh, it has been embellished in various ways by others to the effects that the girl had Rosen plastered over her eyes by the creature Rosen plastered on her eyes and that she became pregnant by it and that she suddenly gave birth to a half-breed that either was stillborn or died shortly after birth or is still hidden by her people from the eyes of white men. She never said any of this, these things to Mr. Burns, but I heard to her straightforward story, adhered to her straightforward story till her death. Nor is this woman's story unique. <clears throat> Sounds pretty unique to me. All of the Amerids. I never heard of that one, have you? So the Amerids, like American Indians, so they call them Amerids of the southern British Columbia, Washington State, Oregon, parts of Idaho, and the Eurox, and the Hoopas of Northern California, not only have similar tales to tell, but history of these creatures so complete and extensive that it would take a volume to tell them. So why does do you do that? Why does anybody do that? I want to hear that. <laughs> the poor Amerids have always been and still are regarded by Americans and Canadians as natives, which indeed they are, but in a same light as the British used to regard the inhabitants of all countries other than their own are at least beyond the confines of Western Europe. The stories told by and the traditions of Amerids are not therefore regarded as much worth or re reliability. Nonetheless, despite the fact that these people did not previously write or have even today little if any contact among themselves over any distance, their reports upon these local ABSMs are absolutely the same uh, all the way from Mackenzie Range to Alaska through the Yukons and the British Columbia down through Washington and Oregon to California and back to the western flanks of the Rockies uh, in Idaho. There are traditions and folk tales spread all over, spread over an even wider area among these people, but this is another matter. I am here speaking 
of perfectly straightforward, up-to-date accounts of encounters with such creatures that have been made by these by them ever since the white men first got to speak with them and which have come in from one source or another annually every year since the capture of Jacko. I will interject some of these as I go along. Before doing so, however, I am put on record that I do not share the old British or what seems to be Curtin American opinion of natives and never have. Furthermore, as a working reporter, having now been privileged to travel ostensibly throughout just a, the five continents with which we are concerned in this history, I would state that I find the so-called natives in some respects on the whole more reliable than the foreigners and the white foreigners are in particular. First, they seem to me to know their country better. Secondly, those of them that are country folk are almost invariably consummate naturalists and know their local fauna inside and out and much better than we do. And third, if they like you and feel that you are not going to laugh at everything they say, they are very pragmatic and are willing to tell you straight what is what in their opinion. Fourth, provided one appreciates their very basic fact that is <clears throat> fact to many non-Europeans, there is a non-material world that is just as real as the material one and one can readily distinguish between stories of one and the other, and may even, without giving offense, ask the teller to which category any story belongs. <clears throat> when my job was collecting animals for scientific institutions in out-of-the-way parts of the world, a profession I pursued for two decades, I always asked the natives for information on their local fauna, why all the people may display and often do so, lapses and gaps in their knowledge, and so just do not know all, do not know an animal that has always been right under their noses. What they do tell, as I found, invariably turned out to be the truth. More than this, some people, such as the Mayas, uh, the Mayas of the Yucatan, are absolutely incredible taxonomists in that they differentiate and have names for every type of animal, so that in one case I found out after long and patient recording fanatically that they even had the spiders of their country classified all in just the same way as docks of our modern <clears throat> zoology. Then finally I would also put on record that I have a particular respect for the non-professional American Indian as he is so inc inc incorrectly and uh, lug oh God, lugubriously called. What word is that? Lugur, lugubriously, labuk, lugubriously called. This guy likes his words, but then again, he did say he was a reporter as well. Or playing the role of reporter, uh, he's got a scientific mind. Lugubriously. How do you pronounce? Uh, 
Okay, let's make this happen. My computer, for some reason, is all of a sudden slow. I think I got too much open. But I lugubriously. Well, what the hell is lugubriously? Lugub lugubriously. <laughs> lugubriously. What the hell does it mean? What the hell does it mean? Lugubriously. Lugubriously. Mournful sense, especially ex exaggerated, um, exaggeratedly, or insincerely mournful. Exaggeratedly or insincerely, or insincerely mournful. Lugubriously. Who the hell ever uses that word? Lugubriously. Lugubriously. My wife and I have lived with various, various of these peoples, and they are as varied as uh, a lot as Europeans, if not more so. Often on, often on, for many years we did so, in rather exceptional circumstances, in that we were neither their employers nor the, nor employees and were not interested specifically in their culture, art, or anything else, but had several mutual interests, interests with them in their crops, stocks, local life, wildlife, and plants. My wife has an exceptional knack of learning languages by ear and under appropriate circumstances, and in local customs she can look like almost any race on earth while I as a doctor or a medical medicine man was on the other hand unobtrusive and inoffensive to them while on the other hand having a wife with me I could browse around in the obscure corners of life without giving concern to the elders or alarm to my male contemporaries. Thus, by simply living alongside these people and going to their dances only for the fun of it, instead of studying their alleged implications and so forth, we came to chat around the evening fires of many things. While I have found the Africans the most enjoyable company at such times of a genuine relaxation, the Malay, the Malayan people, the most informed, sometimes terrifyingly so, to the European, it has been the Amerids. I never heard of them that call that way, had you? Amerids, that I have found to be the most down to earth and pragmatic. Many of these people, and they are the first to admit it, r roar with laughter at the fact and will not be offended by a sincere friend saying so, love to drink alcohol and sometimes indulge in stimulants that we class as narcotics, and when they do so, they can very rarely become uproarious in all manners of ways. At these times, they will concoct the most delicious imaginary compounds of mysticism, ancient tradition, and personal <clears throat> whim, and will there may be all manner of historical gems to be gleaned from such outpourings, not of its none of it should be taken as exact science when however they are stone cold sober in the strictest sense of that loose term they can give out information of a caliber that would do justice at a Yale to a Yale professor don't ever underestimate the air the armorids the amerids or his knowledge. 
I shall not forget to remark. Remark, I, I will not for, forget a remark made to a, a partner of mine who has also lived with these people and likes them very much so that they seem like him. He was making exhaustive inquiries into this very matter of ABSMs when an old gentleman, uh, a doyen of his tribal unit and a pillar of the local church, suddenly <clears throat> burst out with, Oh, don't tell me the white man had finally got around to that. <laughs> Let us nonetheless ignore the Amerids for the moment and concentrate on the unfolding of ABS Emery's Emmer's Emery. I don't like the way that sounds. It's just, mm. The ABS Emmer's Emery in and about British Columbia as reported by white men or allegedly witnesses by witnessed by them. This history is now just about 100 years old, starting with Mr. Anderson of the Hudson Bay Company. During this period, some uh, pale face uh, appears to have reported on ABSM incidents almost every year, and they are now doing so in droves to such an exaggerated extent that even Chambers of Commerce vid that the Harris Lake, the leading resort area in the vast city of Vancouver, have gotten into the act, and one sees large cutouts of creatures all along the highway advertising anything from motels and garages to batteries, cleaning service, and speedboats. Most notable contribution to this tradition has been made in the years 1901, all but two of those were sightings. The rather personal encounters, but usually confirmed by more than one witness, and not just dreary footprints uh, found in the snow or mud, hacks or hanks of hair, overturned barrels and piles of excrement. These, this is really a pretty astonishing picture, and makes a firm's even in Nepal look somewhat uh, pick oh fuck <clears throat> you might be asking why I'm doing this especially being so bad at it but I'll tell you because that's why I'm doing it. Because it's so bad. And I got to force myself to talk. I got to, because of the MS, I got to force myself to do this. And I also, I mean, if it's just but talking to myself, and it's, if I can just talk out loud, I might as well record it regardless of what people think of me. Pick, pick a yun. Pick a yun. Adjective, adjective. A little value, a patry, uh, poultry, or petty, small minded, pick a <laughs> um, How do you use, how do you pronounce pick a Make sure I pronounce it right. A yum. Pick a yum. The New Orleans pick a reported? There was a coolness. Picayune. And it had an image of a. Picayune uh, reported? A Freemason. Longstreet and Kellogg, two uh, couple of in Longstreet's good city. 
hand tucked into his coat, you know what I mean? That hidden hand bullshit. Pick a you all right. What's expect that? Who would expect that? Pick a you Pick a you All of this centers around the low lower Fraser River and notably around Lake Harrison. Therefore, I resort as usual to map map 11 in order to cut down verbiage. All of these reports have been published before and often so many times that there are those who feel that the purpose, the process has been pro, protracted ad, ad hominem ad nauseum, excuse me, ad hominem, ad nauseum. Nevertheless, I am, as I have said myself, reporting, I do not know of any one place where all them have been brought together in chronological order, that anything like this could have been going on for a century, right in front of our, right in our front yard, and being politically in Canada is amazing enough to, but we are to get an even more profound jolt when we come to see that the very same thing has been going on in our own backyard to wit, to wit in Washington, Oregon, California, and according to none other than Theodore Roosevelt, uh, at one time at least in Idaho. The opening gambit was a sworn, sworn statement made by a highly respected lumberman who had also been most successful as a timber, timber uh, cruiser and prospector named Mike King. This gentleman had had to penetrate an isolated area of the north of Vancouver Island in 1901 and alone because his Amer Indian Amer Amer Indian employees refused even to enter it on any account but mostly because they said that it was a territory of the wild men of the woods. From other accounts of Mr. King, it seems that he was not a man to be diverted from essential business routine by such stories, but that he had a profound respect for the local natives because they had guided him to a reasonable fortune on more than one occasion simply by their knowledge of the country and timber that grew in it. <clears throat> Some days after penetrating this wild area, Mr. King topped a ridge and spotted below a creature squatting by a creek, washing some kind of roots and arranging them in two neat piles beside him or her on a bank. This should be compared with the specific remarks made by Mr. Osman in Chapter 3. On the same subject, in my interview with Mr. Osman, he stressed the collection of roots by the creature and even named the plant most chosen. Also, the careful washing and stacking of them. Perhaps he got the notion from reading this account, but I personally doubt it. King's nature in Natural instinct was to raise his rifle in sight, for the creature was large, covered in reddish brown fur, and thus potentially dangerous. By the time the fact that the brown bear doesn't wash roots and stack them up had penetrated, he realized that he had some kind of humanoid 
in his sights, and he lowered his rifle. The creature took off running like a man, and as Mr. King later reported, his arms were peculiarly long. He used freely and climbing and brush running, i.e. scampering on all fours through scrub. King descended the slope and inspected the spore left by the departed one and noted that it was a distinctly human foot but with uh, phenomenally long and spread toes. <coughs> they known him as forever. They got it in a painting in a frickin' they got it in a painting. Just a reminder, they got it in a painting right there. And um Oh, you guys can't see it because it but if this right here, this is what it is talked about, and you can see the spread toes if you get this. I think it's the last judgment or the whatever the hell's I can't remember what it's called. I never can remember the name of this painting. Uh, maybe I should look it up again. Paintings. In the bag again. Judgment Day? Is that what it is? Um, Last Judgment. And it's for the Sistine Chapel. Images. I mean, they know about this, this creature. This creature that uh, somehow has some kind of connection with the trees the neurons of the world of the earth and uh, the underworld that they hijacked and called to hell but uh, saying that I mean it is what it is let's see if these, my computer is really slow I think I need to do something about it clean it up or something I got, uh, <clears throat> I got my book. I got my Grambling running. I got this. I got, I so. And the damn freaking comp uh, Buckeye cable just shaft me saying, like, "Oh, I'm gonna pay you now 101 dollars." Uh, I mean, it's supposed to be 66, and now it's 101. They're supposed to give me a discount and everything. They've done that, and I swear to God, I swear they just do it just to make. I think they don't really want to help anybody else. They just want to make money. Pure business. Anyway, let's see if we can find it. Uh, please open up. The Last Judgment. In this area right there, I'm not getting a good image. Anyways, it's right there in the dead center in the middle. If you look at it, if you look at it, you'll see clearly what I'm talking about with the spread toes. But of course, it doesn't want to show you. <laughs> It's right. You can't see it. Gosh darn it. Alright. I know what to do. Let's just get all this. I know where to find it. In my files. <clears throat> In my files somewhere. In my files, I 
Don't tell me I won't be able to find it in my files now. Screwing up somewhere. Ethereal beings I'm looking at. Okay, I can't find it. I found it in an earlier video. No, I can't find it. Of course not. Anyways, the last judgment, if you look at the d dead center in the bottom, you'll see clearly as it's ga gating the gates are a caveway to the underworld that there, there are these hairy dudes that are in line with the story of Esau, not of Genesis 6. Genesis 6 has nothing to do with Sasquatch. That was unfortunate that what Scott Carpenter did, but maybe he meant well. Um, when he brought that up, and I got a lot, I found a lot of stuff over the years, a lot of stuff, which just goes to prove to me at least that anybody can do this if they just so choose. Most people don't want to do it, I guess. And that's to aim your camera up in the trees, start focusing on the trees. And of course, water is a good uh, area too with trees, small streams. Fellow, be for decent research. Sorry for the dead silence. I'm <clears throat> scrolling through this file here to find uh, 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 where the painting is at. Might have been just better off. Oh, there we go. <clears throat> so interesting. You always hear about these people. Uh, well, first of all, um, interesting in this part of the Last Judgment Pillars. And how many people who have had out-of-body experience or near-death experience talking about the Roman-like pillars? Then we got this thing going on here. Well, the more you pay attention to that, it's almost like, are those monkish? Or are those hairy human being type things? Oh, well, this is this is where it's at, and if you could find that, that got to be a better image. There's a better image. So you can see the spread toes. You can see the hairy guys. The spread toes, and then they got different entities in their paintings. Now they've humanized them. Or, or uh, how do I say this? It's not anthropomorphous. <coughs> Anyways, I can't say the word. Thanks to the MS. So, uh, they, um, yeah, but these hairy dudes, um, very much, they're spread toes. And then, of course, they got the naked guy or people going down into Hades type of thing. <coughs> Which, um, uh, I think, you know, we all come from, uh, a different type of, um, you see the big mouth that it has and the funny ears and it's of course it's exaggerated everything in the painting is exaggerated but they knew about this 
And if they painted this with Michelangelo painted, that means they've known about it for a long time. So, anyways. <clears throat> but these are all a host of characters in here, different entities. And then we have the uh, souls, uh, of course. How do, how do you actually, you know, if you did an actual painting of the entities, it would look like a horror show is what it looked like. <laughs> it would look like a, uh, something people would automatically say demonic based on our own indoctrination. And so um, it's easier just to anthropomorphize them or uh, I can't say the word, or, uh, turn them into human beings. And we don't know. Uh, I mean, you know, if there was a whole bunch of orbs here and then we had different strange looking beings, I think people would be just so freaked out. So they, they just watered it down <coughs> so but who knows that's the problem who knows it's all guesswork isn't it so anyways back to this mr osman and i um play i did a reading of what somebody said uh from an article um i can't remember where it's from but it's in the playlist of the Bigfoot playlist or Sasquatch playlist, one of the two, um, of Osman's and his and what he said in his story. And uh, so this is a famous one of him being kidnapped by these things. Now, what's interesting is, to note, so far we've heard uh, one lady who was uh, supposedly kidnapped when she was 17 or taken and then released. Someone got impregnated and had a uh, stillbirth or miscarriage, allegedly. Is this, although it didn't sound like she admitted that, so I think it might be added to the story. The, um, I mean, I'll probably play a video from, um, is it NTV, uh, in which they, uh, it's not their video, but they played it and broke it down a little bit. And the ethereal looking, uh, Sasquatch. And how the guy got knocked over after shooting him. But I noticed the guy was still alive. They didn't uh, 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 kidnap him or tear him to a bunch of pieces. So apparently um, there seems to be some kind of rules that are in play. Um, then um, uh, Osmond, four days supposedly uh, in their con they, they had hijacked and drug him to their lair. And then they allowed him to escape. Now... You could say it simply was about the snuff, and maybe it was the snuff that kept them. But I think, um, you know, there's four of them, and if they really wanted them, they could have went and, and, and snatched them again. So I think they had their fill of Mr. Osman, and he uh, was allowed to go. Um, well, I guess my point being in this, there's very few... Uh, there's, there's a few stories of tragic things happening, but most of the time what's happening with these things is they're scaring a little hell out of us. This brings up a lot of questions. Especially when you really get into this and you start realizing what's going on here and that it's more in flesh and blood and that there's possible this ultra, um, a pair of physical, ultra dimensional type beings that can come and go. And I don't know, or, and when they show up here, are they really full flesh and blood, or are they more on the plasmic side, and are allowed to be around just long enough to have an interaction here, uh, for whatever reason, uh, the be, and then they go back into the 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 universe. This is massively made of plasma, so. And sure, there's plenty of people out there that could do a better job. Um, sharing their take on things and make it more make it more clear i'm not a great communicator i don't know um got a couple of people who are supposed to join me at some point um i'm hoping that uh they do i won't bring them up until they do so i as far as mentioning them because uh, first of all i mean i'm not getting any traction anyways these interviews and no one's paying attention and i can promote it and i can i'm totally censored they're punish me, and they're gonna probably punish me forever for standing up against uh, 
the global tyranny that we experienced from 2020 to to now, basically, in 2022 at least. And, um, you know, I don't have the strength to go another round of fighting them. I, in fact, I don't even desire, desire it anyways, because it's, it's like, I'll let the younger, more uh, uh, virile and more uh, stronger crowd do, do the fighting. I plant the seed, I, I, I lay down my sword, and, you know, and I'm seeing people now um, talking about this stuff uh, that, that happened in the past uh, several years, and uh, they're allowed to now start talking about it. Uh, but somebody had to um, have enough guts to say something about it. There was one along with thousands of others, and now I'm paying the price. And since I'm paying the price anyways, and I know I'm not going to be allowed to grow, I mean, I guess I could play the game and buy some subs. But I'm not going to do that. So I'd rather have two people follow me and share in my journey than 2,000 people. And because I'm really not interested in entertaining people. I like to plant the seed. To get people to do to do their own research and do the next step, and I, I do believe that I be connection to all this and understanding uh, what's going on, um, a big part of it, let's say, an important part. It'd be a better way of saying it is the trees. <clears throat> and we just get people to actually start aiming the camera up in the trees, but then again, I got my own research. Plus, I got to write my book, and then I got to do a. I don't know what the hell's going to happen. It's like, uh, as usual, things start building up. But, um, if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. I want it to be, so it shall be. All right, that's what they say. Uh, I want to have, uh, I am healthy. I just have to make it happen. In the interview with Mr. Osmond, he stressed the collective roots by these creatures and even named the plants blah 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 perhaps he he got the notion okay blah 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 blah, blah. the creature took off and okay blah blah the king did this like blah blah okay and so we got the point okay and, um phenomenally long and sp spreading toes that's an important thing and then we have to ask ourselves if they have spreading toes and if the real ones have spreading toes, and then how do they make it so that they look like they're not spreading toes? And then are we dealing with the same thing? And then we got to ask ourselves the question about that there's the hoaxers, and that's, you know, which is pretty hard to do uh, at times. Not so hard to do. It all depends on the audience. Uh, maybe the more gullible might buy you, you faking, uh, Footprints, uh, but most of these footprints are a couple at best, or they're going to trail and just uh, end in the middle of nowhere, like it just been like zooped up or went through a portal or just vanished. <coughs> All right, and some look more like ours, and then some look like we're saying here spread toes, and so then there's a question: Is are we dealing with multiple different? entities or beings are we dealing with some kind of um, I don't know I mean there's something deeper going on here it seems it is it's beyond the evolution of a scare uh, tree and it's beyond our own understanding at this point and I think that what has happened is religion has hijacked this because people need certainty and plus, also, emperor, empires need to present themselves as all-knowing, godlike, and have all the answers. And they can't afford to have to be telling people, well, you know, a cataclysmic event is going to happen in 20 years. Or, um, you know, there, there's beings and entities out there that we have no control over. You know what I mean? There's a lot of things that could happen. I mean, just to think of the, um, the posses. Um, 
that would have been if, uh, the number of groups of uh, these guys, what do you want to do this weekend? Well, let's go get some more of these things, you know what I mean? Which I'm sure they did at one time anyways. That's the reason why they're not around. But I just think, and knowing human nature, right? I mean, there's a reason why there's not a wolf. You haven't seen a roof in your backyard. The odds are if you listen to this. And, um, you know, there are still some here or there, but for the most part, they're gone. Um, most part, I mean, there's just certain places where you're going to run across a brown bear and a grizzly bear or a puma or a, a lion. You know, we don't particularly like to see uh, us or our children being mauled by these things. And so what we do is we get rid of them. Now, if there's, if there's a Bigfoot out there, there's a being that can literally uh, kidnap us or hijack us. And it's a good chance that they've been thoroughly been uh, or systematically been wiped out. Um, and uh, is it would it be any good for them? Any good for them? If um, we all knew about that they existed, and 100% for sure, say in uh, Quebec or the Northwest or in. Uh, British Columbia or in California, even though most people do know about it, there's still that high degree of doubt because there's not a lot of these bodies that showed up or uh, uh, as they say, there's not one in a zoo that we know of. Um, and if there was one in a zoo, I got a good feeling that knowing how human beings are, right, being uh, adventurers and conquerors and uh, explorers and usurpers and all the other things that are about us that make us who we are, I, I'm pretty sure there would be companies of men that would say, hey, what are we going to do this weekend? Let's go find one, boys. So I could just see like a call clubs, you know how they have that golfing clubs or they have rock clubs or they have all these. I could just see it, how they, you know, there's one thing about the Bigfoot community. They have a community. And yeah, and they do do some pseudo research. It's not really serious. I wouldn't consider it serious. You know, tromping around in the woods with a group of you guys. It's great. And I think it's wonderful you're doing that. Because you're connecting to nature. But the odds of you actually running across a Bigfoot with 20 of you guys. Or 30. Or even 4 of you. Or even t 2 of you. It's pretty slim because... Um, they know what you're doing, and they're more aware of you than you are with them, and they're going to be high tail now that long before you ever show up. And so, um, you know, it's very difficult to make these things happen, you know. The, I mean, I've seen them firsthand. I've had clo up-close encounters. i filmed some things, and I know that nobody would be... Unless you're experienced in this, only the experienced people would accept it and put it and compartmentalize it and put it in this category and say, yeah, you've seen something that we call Bigfoot or Sasquatch, um, which I, do, I argue that we are making a mistake by labeling everything Sasquatch or, uh, as he brings up too about the abominable snowman, we're all dealing with multiple things and a lot of them look alike. As far as being real hairy, in different sizes, and uh, um, they come and go. It's like they just show up, and then they just disappear. And people will say, you know, rationalize and say they, they're migrating, stuff like that. And, and you know, it makes sense. You know, if you're very uh, from a uh, uh, scientific, uh, materialistic perspective, but in reality, is um. We don't know what we're dealing with. But we do have historical uh, stories and accounts. Believe enough in the Bible, Esau it clearly is talking about something that's like a Sasquatch or a hairy man or a hairy man of the woods. That's not a human being. Esau is not no way in hell that's a human being. <laughs> yeah, there's no human being that's hairy like a freaking goat for head to toes, except for the palm of his hands. And the, the sole of his feet. Uh, just, just isn't. I mean, there's some pretty hairy dudes, but they're not as hairy as a goat. And all I do is look at what a goat looks like. So, so then we got to deal with that. And um, I've lost total track here. Let me get into this. 
I've been reading so much I, uh, to move my mouth, and for better or worse, because my vocal cords are just, I've always been weak to begin with, and they've become very weak. So, uh, you know, plus, you know, it's, it's good to keep your mind active one way or another, so for now I'm staring at words that I can barely see. I want to thank you, you know, thank goodness I got this computer, thank goodness the, the Squash Gang and uh, Squash, Sasquatch Confessors are helping, helping me out. I mean, I paid for most of it that they, I mean, they paid for, well, they paid for about 40% of it, so. Unfortunately, them, I still wouldn't. I wouldn't be having a computer right now. I'd be maybe now just be getting the computer, and then um, hopefully it'll last long enough for to get the books read, written, and to find some way to make some money. Mr. King reported. That he had long toes and and his arms were, you know, what did he say about his arms? Were peculiarly long. I read the original account from an old clipping to a company of Easterners some years ago. I heard somebody murmur, so, and so endeth the first lesson. And so indeed, for although that statement has been repeatedly recounted and my king has been repeatedly said I have elaborated no further direct quotes appear to have been extended this is the way the unexpected things happen I know uh, the few that I have experienced you are not prepared for them by the time you have managed to bring your senses to bear upon them, they were up and away, and you are left gaping uh, with uh, blurred impressions all around. It says this remarkable particular word, long, used to describe the toes uh, rather than the whole foot, is most pertinent as we shall see uh, when we come to examine the tracks of the Oh, Mars. So, anyways. So, uh, yeah. And so, um, when it does happen, you're not prepared for it. And you're left gaping or gasping or in shock. And with a blurred Im impression all around. A single vivid c uh, centerpiece. What more can you add unless you want to be a, uh, a, a tattler or a liar. King James apparently, Mike, Mike King, King James, Mike King apparently had both the decency and the common sense to say what he had to say and then shut up. The next uh, lot have a similar encounter. In 1904, uh, or out hunting uh, near Great Central Lake on Vancouver Island. Their names were J. Kine, Kine Aid. I can't, it's not, or it's not Kincaid, is it? Maybe it's Kincaid. And T. Hutchins, a grump, a crump, and uh, W. Bus. Four citizens of Quillacum. They were apparently beating the bush and put up what they after described as a boy, um, ABSM, that was covered with brown hair but had long red hair and a beard. It is very odd to report that in that the otherwise crop up crops up only once or twice in all the accounts of ABSMs and is categorically contrary to all the other reports by everyone who 
has alleged that he or she has seen these creatures at close range. <clears throat> so let's try this again. They were, they, were, they were apparently beating the bush. Put up what they afterward described. So I missed it. They were beating. They must have uh, been making a racket or something. And and they scared, scared out a, what is it, a, a boy, ABSM, that was covered with red hair but had long red hair but had but had long head hair and a beard third uh, a classic report is dated 1907 and was made by the captain and crew of a coastal steamer uh, Capilano so the Capilano on their return from a routine cruise during which they had called a small landing named Bishop Cove. There, they said, the entire American Indian population had come charging aboard, begging for asylum and outright immigration. Due to a huge monkey-like man-shaped creature that had been clamming along their beach, for a number of nights in succession and which gave vent to most disturbing high-pitched howls. These people readily identified the creature but insisted that it had moved into their territory with its family, if not its whole clan, and that it would not broke any interference by a few poorly armed humans. The comment on this report are rather illuminating as they display a curious acknowledgement of the presence of such wild men and in fact that while they are accepted as being basically peaceable and known uh, to mind their own business while they avoid organized men and masses, they tend to adopt a nasty tone when it comes to hunting and collecting rights, and appear then to regard Americans as interlopers and a, and a nuisance. In 1907, however, the attitude of even the British towards real primitives was going through a peculiar phase. Halfway between the concept of the worthless native and that of the Nova Savage, the Ameriens Ameri had proved an unreliable labor force, while certain other non-Europeans had turned out to be far too civilized for rank exploitation. The idea of really primitive creatures had not yet been abandoned, and everyone was still undecided just how uh, to behave towards them. The thought that we might be dealing with subhumans did not, of course, occur to anybody professing any education. After all, Darwin was hardly cold uh, as of then, but it remained in no way illogical to the uneducated, and it was played on by the press. This may, in some measures, measure account for the solemnity with which a discovery made in 1912 was greeted. I got this report from Mr. Burns, or is it Burns or Bums? I'm going to go Burns, mentioned above. It came to him from the principal, a Mr. Ernest A. Edwards, who states that he was residing in Shushwap, B.C. at that date 
and that be that he and his wife had unearthed on a on a small island of Neskin Neskin a little way off the coast a human skeleton that they found protruding from the bank of the river the location was noted for its abundance and arrowheads of a uh, uh, era arm Amer Indians Amer Indians origin the skeleton is stated to have measured from skull to ankle joint seven and six seven feet seven seven feet and six inches so with feet and scalp the person must have been eight feet tall oh, I have you more than that maybe Mr. Burns received this information in a letter from Mr. Edwards in 1941 and this included the further comments that I together with my wife examined the jaw the teeth were huge size but in perfect condition no cavities noticeable the jawbone was so large that it would span my face easily at a cheekbone at the cheekbone together with the help of the Indians I created it and shipped it to Wrexham Museum in North Wales, England, where I believe it still is. In his acknowledgement, the curator of the museum was greatly astonished, remarking, among other observations, that it was hard to believe such a bone and teeth existed in human, human beings. There, there is uh, a recept the receipt of such intelligence as uh, as uh, I need to stop I need to go back to what I need to do you are going to try go all the way Otherwise, don't even start. If you are going to try, go all the way. This could mean losing girlfriends, wives, relatives, jobs, and maybe your mind. Thank you.